course. They should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDX, to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRF. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme, which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, and the new globalization. This year, in response to what is happening globally and locally, the DPRM is focusing on the theme, bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. Through this theme, we hope to help in channeling our collective resolve as a nation toward moving forward from the adverse impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. For us to bounce back from this crisis, we must innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward the path of renewed growth and dynamism. A whole of society approach is crucial with the government taking the lead and engaging all stakeholders, including the private sector, academia, civil society, and local communities to innovate and reconfigure their strategies, structures, and processes. To adapt to the new normal, which entails a new way of working, learning, and interacting with one another, public and private sectors need to invest in digital education, e-commerce, e-finance, e-health, and other innovative ways of delivering services. At the same time, the government should ramp up its social protection system to assist the most vulnerable sectors seriously affected by increasing unemployment and loss of income. As individual citizens, we also have a role to play in helping the country bounce back from the new normal. We should be innovative, adaptive, and agile in the face of adversity and change. By shifting to a new brand of governance that is agile and innovative, we can beat this crisis. Visit the DPRM website for more information. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Sheila Sierra. I will be moderating this event. So um, we still have uh, four minutes uh, to go before we start. Uh, in the meantime, just uh, 
settle down and uh, may we request you to please read the house rules that, that are flash on the screen. Salamat po. See you at uh, nine o'clock.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 18th Development Policy Research Month Kickoff Forum. I am Sheila Sear of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, and I will be moderating this event. For many Filipinos, the month of September sig signals the start of the Christmas season, or what we call the bear months. Well, September is more than that for the Philippine government. It is Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, a nationwide celebration in the entire government pursuant to, presiden to presidential proclamation number 247 signed in 2002. This proclamation declared the month of September as DPRM to promote and draw nationwide appreciation of the importance and necessity of policy research in crafting evidence-based plans, policies, and programs. The DPRM also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and, and research issues among the countries decision makers and policy makers and through the different topics highlighted in every DPRM celebration this event also aims to raise the public's literacy of important socioeconomic issues to officially open our virtual event this morning and to explain this year's DPRM theme I now call on the president of PIDS Dr. Celia Reyes. Mamsel. Thank you Sheila. Good morning everyone. Before we start, allow me to acknowledge the following. Uh, we have um, Quezon City Mayor Joy Belmonte, Municipal Mayor Janet Ilagan of Mataas na Kahoy, Batangas. Uh, we have Department of Science and Technology Under Secretary Renato Solidum Jr. From the Senate Economic Planning Office, we have Director General Ronald Golding and Director Sarah Sesni Tafan. And from the Congressional Planning and Budget Research Department, we have Director General Romulo Miral Jr. and Executive Director Novel Bangsal. We have Department of Labor and Employment Institute of Labor Studies Executive Director Ama Karisma Lubrin Satumba. Uh, we have National Institute for Technical Education and Skills Development Acting Executive Director David Bugalion. We have CHED Commissioner Dr. Alex Brillantes. And from the National Economic and Development Authority, we have Director Florante Igtiben, Regional Director Susan Sumbeling, Regional Director Agnes Espinas Tolentino, Regional Director Florita Ridao, Regional Director Rilion Nestor, Regional Director Bonifacio Uy, um, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Director Laura Ignacio, BIR Deputy Commissioner David Lani. Department of Budget and Management Regional Director Jenny Partosa, Philippine Statistical Research Training Institute Executive Director Josefina Almeda, and from the academe we have Ateneo Innovation Center Director Carlos Opus, Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development Director Dr. Alvin Ang, the AP Senior Vice President for Programs Magdalena Mendoza, Miriam College Center for Strategic Research Executive Director Maria Carmen Peñalosa. PNU Educational Policy Research and Development Center Director David Adonis, UPLB Institute for Governance and Rural Development Director Dr. Jane Reyes, Pampanga State Agricultural University Dean Maria Cristina Dizon, PUP Graduate School Dean Elmer De Jose, University of Southeastern Philippines College of Development Management Dean Dr. Rek Eguia, UPLB Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs Dr. Eleno Peralta, Matter Day Academy Dean Dr. Ross Alonso. And from um, the PIDS Board of Trustees, we have Attorney Rafael Lotilia and also former board members and um, Institute of Corporate Directors President Dr. Alfredo Pascual, who's also an, uh, currently advisor to the PIDS Board, and former PIDS Board of Trustees Dr. William Padolina. And from the CSOs and international organizations, we have the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines President, Governor Daki Lakua, Local Government Development Foundation National Coordinator, Dr. Antonio Avila Jr., Philippine Social Science Council Executive Director, Dr. Lourdes Portus, the Asia Foundation President, Mr. Sam Chitik, Philippine Software Industry Association Executive Director, Ayn In King, Earthquakes and Megacities Initiative Secretary General Violeta Seva, Lawig PH Executive Director Richel Diane Claros, Social Watch Co-Convener Jessica Cantos, and we have from the private sector Regulus Space Tech President Dr. Rahel Marie Sese. Let me also welcome our guests from other government agencies, local government units, the academic, civil society, media, private sector, as well as viewers from our Facebook page. 
Thank you for joining the kickoff forum of the 18th Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. For this year's theme, in consultation with our DPM's, uh, DPRM steering committee partners, we chose Bouncing Back Together, Innovating Governance for the New Normal, or in Filipino, Makabagong Pamamahala para sa Samasamang Pagbangon sa New Normal. Through this theme, we want to highlight the importance of innovating governance across all sectors of society amid the COVID-19 pandemic and other perennial threats such as climate change, food insecurity, and economic slowdown. To be able to surpass and move forward from this crisis, we need to have an agile and innovative government. But how can we achieve this kind of government? The present time calls for the implementation of institutional reforms, upskilling of the public sector workforce, adoption of smart systems, and strengthening coordination across all levels of government. All these topics will be discussed in today's forum. We will start with the presentation of PIDS Research Fellows, Dr. Justin Sikat and Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, about innovating governance, building resilience against COVID-19 and other risk. Then we will hear the views of our panelists in the context of their respective offices. We are privileged to have Assistant Secretary Carlos Sabad Santos of the National Economic and Development Authority, Assistant Secretary Toledo of the Department of Budget and Management, Assistant Governor Illuminada Sikat of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, and Mayor Abigail Binay of Makati City. We hope that our forum today will help browse your interest in the significance of innovating governance and motivate you to do your share in helping the country get back on its feet amid this pandemic. Let me take this opportunity to thank the permanent members of the DPRM Steering Committee, such as the National Economic and Development Authority, Civil Service Commission, Philippine Information Agency, BSP, Department of the Interior and Local Government, Presidential Management Staff, BBM, Senate Economic Planning Office, and the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department for their usual support and cooperation. We also wish to convey our gratitude to the Department of Health, Department of Information and Communications Technology, and the Department of Social Welfare and Development for accepting our invitation as this year's DPRM Steering Committee additional members. Today's virtual forum is just one of the series of activities lined up for the DPRM celebration. We will have the Mindanao Policy Research Forum, or the MPRF, on September 10. The MPRF is an annual forum organized by PIDS and the Mindanao Development Authority in partnership with the local university in Mindanao. This year's theme is Bouncing Back in the New Normal through Crunchyside Development and Agricultural Resilience to highlight the importance of innovating the agriculture sector amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also be holding a four-part webinar series for the Annual Public Policy Conference, or the APPC, which is the main and culminating activity of the DPRM celebration. We will have the webinar series on September 15, 17, 22, and 24. We hope to see you all again in these webinars. We have invited both local and foreign experts and speakers to the webinar series to discuss various topics such as institutional innovation, civil service reforms, e-government, and smart solutions, among others. Please visit the DPRM section of the PIDS website to learn more about the theme and activities this September. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope that you will stay with us until the end and actively participate in the open forum later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansell. Well, before we proceed to the presentations, may I have your attention regarding our house rules? Uh, for all attendees, you may have noticed that your microphone is muted upon entry, and we do this to prevent any background noise. But this doesn't mean that you cannot join the discussion. To join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of the screen. Just type your name and affiliation and your question and send it to everyone and not to a particular person. I will read your question during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your questions concise. Okay, and for our viewers on Facebook, they are also very much welcome to participate in our discussion. Just type your question in the comment section on Facebook. Okay, 
Our first presentation this morning is the concept paper of PIDS, which served as the basis of this year's DPRM theme. It discusses the importance of governance innovation to improve our response to this pandemic and to build the Philippines' overall resilience to risks in the long term. This presentation was made by a team of uh, research, fel research fellows at PIDS, consisting of Dr. Obri Tabuga, Dr. Justine Sika, Dr. Sonny Domingo, and Dr. Valerie Ureb. The presentation will be made by Dr. Obri Tabuga and Dr. Justine Sika. Justine and Obri. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shar. Good morning. Um, but first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, as mentioned by Dr. Shar a while ago. Um, these are Dr. Justin Sikat, Dr. Sunny Deming, and Dr. Val Ulep, who make up the, the technical committee for this year. So each year, PIDS assigns a technical committee to facilitate the formulation of the DPRM and APPC themes, or Annual Public Policy Conference themes. This year, the technical committee came up with a concept paper or background study that serve as the basis for crafting the DPRM theme, which is bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you the rationale and the DPRM theme, as well as the annual public policy conference theme. As you may know and has been mentioned a while ago, the annual public policy conference, conference or APPC is a DPRM's culminating activity. And the conference where various topics under the DPRM theme will be discussed in greater detail. So after my presentation, Dr. Justine Sikat will carry on with a brief discussion of the insights that we have obtained from that background study. And it provides a review of the literature as well as an examination of some local and international experiences that are, that are relevant to our theme. So the theme for this year's APPC or Annual Public Policy Conference is Innovating Governance, Building Resilience Against COVID-19 Pandemic and Other Risks. Next slide, please. The unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic is by far the most challenging public health crisis the world has faced in a century. It has overwhelmed global and national health service and disaster management infrastructure and brought economies to a standstill. It becomes a much larger social support or social protection issue with direct implications on the government's capacity to finance, administer, and design effective strategies. It has put local governments at the forefront of quarantine enforcement, contact tracing and, in, and monitoring, as well as in program implementation, such as in administering the social amelioration. We may all agree that th these challenging times had exposed a lot of governance and structural issues that we must address. This is the reason why we centered this year's DPRM and APPC themes on the need for innovation in governance, especially in the public sector, given its crucial function in or facilitating an enabling environment. Next slide, please. What are these structural and governance issues? It is not our intention to present all of the issues that we have in governance, but only the key ones manifested in the past few months during the pandemic, and these are the following. First, there is lack of and sometimes failure of coordination between and among government units. Another key issue is the lack of protocols or manuals of operations to deal with such an event at the onset. Also, the poor and updated state of our information system caused delays in data gathering efforts that are essential for understanding the real-time situation upon which key decisions are made. We also observed the absence of a verified tool or the need to improve the existing tool for targeting program beneficiaries of social assistance efforts, which hampered the implementation of programs like the SAP. We also noted the lack of technically capable workforce at various levels of the government, and this was visible in the pandemic period. Next, please. With these issues and many other issues that we did not mention, we believe that the pandemic is an impetus, a rare window of opportunity we can all learn from and innovate. These are, or there are articles showing that it has ignited the geniuses in many. It has brought people together to collaborate and innovate. And this is because the effects are so wide ranging. We noted that some countries took advantage of situations such as this, even less um, challenging, and they reformed. In the Philippines, though we've seen some improvements, we want to, 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 to say that we must take advantage of this rare wind 
opportunity in a substantial way now that we have the huge support from the government and where people are more likely to back government decisions for innovation. So based on our brief uh, review of governance issues, we chose three key themes that we must focus on. These are institutions, people, and smart systems. So why institutions? A lot of the issues that we face concern protocols, uh, strategies, mechanisms, standards, whether these are for coordinating, coordinating government units and states toward a common vision or goal, or whether this is about sharing information that are vital in decision-making processes. Apart from institutions, we need to upgrade, upskill our people, the civil service more specifically. People are vital to innovation, hence we must examine this aspect. Lastly, we want PC and the DPRM to tap smart systems, which are vital for achieving seamless and efficient delivery. As mentioned earlier, we have weak information systems and infrastructure, and it is essential that we innovate in our systems. We propose to have these key themes in the discussions because of their interdependence with one another, to develop and take advantage of smart systems in policy making and service delivery. The proper legal framework must exist stipulating their protocols and standards, and people must possess the analytical, operational, and even political capacity in the development and implementation of smart systems and other systems. So what is, um, what is governance innovation? Let me now move to the definition of an important concept here. In the public sector, innovation refers to the implementation of a significant change in the way organization operates or in the products it provides. They comprise new and significant changes to services and goods, operational processes, organizational methods, and the way organizations communicate with users or with the citizenry. These must be new to the organization, although they, have, they may have been developed by others. They can either be the result of decisions within organizations or in response to new regulations or policy measures. What activities can be considered innovation? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are in-house or acquired external activities that intend to or actually lead to the implementation of innovation. They can be R&D activities or they can be education and training of staff related to innovation. They can be experimentation for innovation and others. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. The innovation activities can be categorized into various types, um, which are quite useful to know. These are process innovation, product innovation, organizational innovation, and communication innovation. Due to time constraints, I will be providing detailed definition. But simply, innovation refers to the new and improved methods, while product innovation refers to new or improved services. One-stop shops are an example of organizational innovation, while automatic SMS updates, such as in the, in the case of calamities, is an example of communication innovation. In our review of various innovation activities inside and outside the country, we found that it is good to take stock of what's currently been implemented. This helps us realize that innovation is not impossible and, in fact, can be done continuously for achieving significant improved outcomes, even for a developing country such as ours. Dr. Justin Sikat will discuss some of these governance innovations that we have reviewed from the literature which you can all learn from or which you can use as discussion points in the upcoming conference and other events under the DPRM. Dr. Sikat, please. Thank you, Dr. Tabuga. Uh, next slide, please, Wang. So good morning. I'll be presenting to you the Development Policy Research Month uh, sub-themes for the culminating annual public policy conference which uh, for this year's theme focuses on innovating governance to bounce back together. Um, as Dr. Tabuga mentioned earlier, we had identified the key issues um, this past year in terms of government's response and providing goods and services to this pandemic. And the key issues focused largely around the lack of information or the lack of coordination or sharing this information. Um, the gra grappling with the uh, correct protocols and manners in which to deliver. So from these, we identified three key areas, as mentioned earlier, and looked to similar experiences in different countries. 
So the sub-themes for this year's annual public policy conference are institutional equations, innovations in the civil service, and smart systems. Next slide, please. So for institutional innovations, we would like to highlight information or information technology as an institution. What exactly are institutions? By Nobel Prize winning economists, Douglas North and Oliver Williamson, they define institutions as the rules of the game. This could be the laws, the mandates, the protocol, the infrastructure, the data technology, which are the foundation for governance, which is the play of the game. As we saw in the response to COVID, information played a crucial role first in directly identifying those who were affected by COVID, those who were ill, getting them healthcare, contact tracing, those who might be ill, uh, reporting, monitoring, and sharing this information. So that's one major role of information. The second is to identify those who were indirectly affected by the COVID pandemic because of economic slowdowns due to the quarantines that were necessary to stop the spread of the virus. So an example of this perfectly would be the SAP, as mentioned by Dr. Tabuga earlier. This was the program that um, aimed to um, reach 80 million households, uh, the poorest of the poor, and um, the delay in the first tranche distribution, according to the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and, uh, Development, was because primarily of the lack of integrated information systems to identify who, in fact, the household um, beneficiaries were, um, the challenge or the varied uh, manners of implementation of social welfare programs in local governments, as well as the challenge in vetting um, the, uh, to avoid duplication of distribution of the SAP. So had an integrated information system been in place, had it been linked, let's say, to Listahanan, which is the social welfare uh, targeting system of the Philippines, and had it been directly connected to the bank accounts of the beneficiaries, it would have been easier to distribute um, the much needed benefits to those at the timeliest possible time. So we look to other countries and their experiences, uh, similar experiences such as the Philippines. And we found two general theme, um, areas of focus for reform. First would be in terms of data transparency and sharing. In the case of South Korea, after they experienced MERS in 2015, and the case of Taiwan, after they experienced SARS in 2003, they overcame issues in data privacy, implementing various reforms in data sharing and transparency as well as um, information campaigns to build trust in these reforms. Another area that um, we saw in the literature was that there is um, strengthening and establishing of both short-term and long-term responses to public health issues by establishing institutions across different public institutions, uh, agile responses once public health threats were recognized, and as well as systematic and procedural threat responses. For the um, establishing of institutions across different public institutions. What the Korean government did was they established a Korean Center for Developed Disease Control. Um, in the case of Taiwan as well, they established a mechanism where there would be a central epidemic command center once a threat was perceived. Uh, Singapore's National Center for Infectious Diseases also served the same purpose. Um, in terms of agile responses, uh, we know that Taiwan and Vietnam immediately closed their borders. Uh, when it when they perceived the threat earlier this year of the COVID pandemic. Um, at the same time, in the case of Taiwan, they linked the immigration records with the health insurance records so that if a person went to a doctor, it would immediately reflect there if that person had traveled, in fact, to a COVID, um, a country that has COVID. Um, next slide, please. With re regards to innovations and governance innovations in the civil service, we reviewed the literature and um, grouped together according to the certain aspect or element of the civil service that these reforms tried to address. So in the first column on the left, you can see that there are four major aspects or elements of the civil service and some prerequisites necessary. So let's go through them individually. First, career incentives was a major um, topic um, when it came to reforms in the civil service, it was intended, it's intended to attract stronger candidates, such as in the Zambian experience, as well as the European bottom-up approach. Uh, communication and information, as I mentioned earlier, also plays a huge role. 
Singapore's public service in the 21st century reform introduced a feedback loop so that management and staff could have continuous improvements in their communication. The Zambian experiment um, aimed to reduce information asymmetry and provide as complete information as possible. Um, another very important element in these reforms in governance innovations in the civil service was the perception that management and staff all equally are involved in innovations in the civil service. So it's, it's a partnership. In the case of Singapore, coordinated vision more than coordinated action is underscored. What does this mean? It means that it's important to have coordinated action to implement governance innovations, but all those in civil service should also have a coordinated vision. Um, investment in management and staff also is um, high on the list for these reforms, uh, like in the case of Singapore and the European bottom-up approach. Now, where do innovations come from? Well, there are two, internal and external. So internally, the Nordic approach identifies specific roles for management, top management, managers, and staff. Whereas the bottom-up approach supports innovation and governance innovation through experiments within the organization. Uh, in terms of external sources of innovation, the knowledge scanning approach used by European countries seeks training and collaboration with external bodies. For example, uh, government could learn from business processes um, to improve the delivery of public goods and services, as well as look outside of the country for innovations. Um, however, all of these innovations have a huge prerequisite. Okay? What are the prerequisites? There has to be political will, according to the Singaporean reform. Uh, at the same time, there must be continuous learning or growth mindset of all those involved. And, and there should be the diverse team construction, meaning that there are those who are creatives and come up with the innovations. But there are also those who are good at um, implementing or putting into action the ideas or the innovations that are created. Next, please. As for the, the, the final sub theme of our conference this year, it's smart systems. We saw in the literature that in response to risks and epidemics experienced by other countries, or even some cities here in the Philippines, they had established centralized command centers, either for disasters, infectious diseases, public safety and security. However, again, the prerequisite of this was that there had to be integrated information technology systems and data interoperability across all these levels for these command centers to be successful. Next slide, please. So I'll be showing you some examples in the case of Estonia, which has been 30 years in the making. Um, the major steps taken to establish e-government based on Estonian information policy included establishing smart data infrastructure for its interconnected system. And secondly, implementing mandatory digital identification. These reforms allowed them to now provide services such as e-voting, e-taxes, e-healthcare, e-notary, e-school, e-police, and so on and so forth. The list is very long. Um, for Service Canada, it offers a single point of access to federal government services to 50 programs and services of 16 departments and agencies. And the benefits of this was that it allowed in terms of government operations, cost reduction with enhanced efficiency because of the implementation of controls to avoid fraud and abuses in certain services. It also provided the necessary data for rigorous forecasting, planning, tracking, and monitoring of government programs. In the case of Singapore's Smart Nation, it was both public and private reforms that were instituted. First, similar to Estonia, was the national digital identity. Second were e-payments. Third, Smart Nation sensor platform. Fourth, Smart Urban Mobility. Fifth, Moments of Life. And sixth, Codex. In the Philippines also, there are a couple of cities that I'd like to mention here that had central command stations for different purposes. In the case of Davao City, there were IT apps uh, constructed to reduce crime and respond to international threats. And these apps use data from CCTV surveillance and the geographical information systems, uh, central 911 command information, and data from the Interpol which was accessed, which is accessed through the Philippine Center on Transnational Crimes. In the case of Makati City, also their smart system for disaster preparedness and communication. Next slide, please. 
how do we innovate and build resilience? Well, for institutions, we need to create an environment conducive to innovations by installing and implementing or simply fully implementing existing laws and mandates because there are several that need to be fully implemented that will enable interagency collaboration and has integrated interconnected information systems for data interoperability and clear protocols for operations. In terms of people, we need to provide an effective incentive structure in the civil service to retain good people in government and give clear information about career incentives and movement with a growth learning mindset, which is also very crucial. There needs to be continuous um, upskilling, retooling of the workforce to it to become adaptive to changes in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. In terms of smart systems, we need to have updated and integrated information systems, promote data and information digitalization, and ensure that there is secure data sharing transmission, information access, electronic data archiving, as well as improve IT infrastructure. But more importantly, we have to build trust through information campaigns so that everyone has their role and plays their role in bouncing back together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aubrey and Justine. Dr. Justine Sikat is an assistant professor at the Verata School of Business, University of the Philippines, and currently on secondment at PIDS as a research fellow. On the other hand, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga has been with PIDS for um, two decades as a researcher, and she obtained her PhD in public policy in 2019 from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. For our next set of presentations, we invited officials from various agencies to react on the DPRM theme in the context of their agency's mandate. We asked them to provide examples of their agency's initiatives in, in, in innovating governance. We'll hear first from the uh, Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning of the National Economic and Development Authority, Orneda. Uh, he was previously the director of uh, the governance staff under the same office. As assistant secretary, he has oversight and supervision on planning and policy formulation of the following sector staffs, agriculture, natural resources, environment, governance, macroeconomy, social development, and trade services and industry. Here now is assistant secretary Carlos Abad Santos for, her, for his a uh, presentation titled New Normal and Institutional Innovation in the Public Sector. Asek? Yes, um, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank um, the PIDs for again inviting Ned, as always, to be part and partner um, in um, the annual um, DPRM um, activities of PIDs. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Celia Reyes and company. Um, again, my presentation comes from a the perspective of a, of a planning agency in terms of the new normal and institutional innovation in the public sector. Next, please. And um, I have I have four parts to my presentation. I, I'd like to start with um, again leveling off of what institutional innovation um, is. Second. Um, um, looking at the impact of the pandemic as a, as a catalyst of change. Um, third will be what are the government initiatives in promoting governance innovation. And fourth will be challenges in the digital economy. Next, please. Okay, let me start with um, uh, just, just to level off. Um, this was discussed with Dr. Tabuga. And I'd like to also um, level up on what, um, we, how we use institutional um, innovation and um, how it, it is applied in the public sector. Next, please. Yes, um, again, as discussed earlier, um, institutional innovations are changes um, introduced in either organizations or institutions at different levels, they can be at the micro level, at the meso level, at the macro level, and either reacting to or anticipating confirmed or expected changes. Again, um, these innovations can be incremental um, or they can also be radical. 
Um, and um, institutional innovation allows organizations to re-architect themselves to scale learning and generate richer innovations at other levels, including products, business models, and management systems, especially during times of disruption and rapid change. And indeed, um, the, the pandemic is um, indeed a, a time where there is disruption all over the place. Next, please. As I said, um, institutional innovation um, is a continuum. Um, it can be an incremental type um, or it can be a radical type. And then it can also occur either at the organizational or institution level or it can also occur in the systems level or systemic level. So I guess um, a lot of institutions or organizations do incremental types of um, innovations. Um, however, I think what's important given the disruptions and, 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 and the VUCA, it's important also to, to look at a more radical and more systemic um, type of innovations, particularly in the, in the public sector. However, it's also important to do this at the organization level. But, I, 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 but, but we get um, more impact if we do it, um, let's say, call of government um, or at the sectoral level or at, at, at the interagency level. And when we apply um, institutional innovation into, um, in, into the, the public sector, we basically refer, we usually refer to that as governance reform. Uh, and my next slide um, would look at basically um, how, how governance reform, next please. Yes, um, we look at how, um, how governance reform takes place um, uh, in the public sector. Basically, again, um, it can be at the organizational level, uh, which again was discussed by Dr. Tabuga earlier, and that this can be in terms of systems, human resources, or structures within the organization. And that can also, but, but, but that can also occur um, acro um, across um, organizations or at the institutional level or again at the sectoral level or even the whole of government level and these two areas interact with each other but the important thing here is is again the 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 outcome that you want here is um either um, improved service delivery improved products um better social protection mechanisms so again um both um both organizational change and institutional change will be driven um, by the institutional innovations that are adapted um, by either the individual agencies or at the at the national or LG levels. Um, in terms of um, INEDA, basically, next slide, please. Um, we've approached um, governance reform um, in different areas. And again, as, as a planning agency and as the central uh, planning agency of, um, of the government, um, some of these initiatives are, number one, we, we repackage the Philippine Development Plan from a predominantly sectoral um, to a thematic orientation with clear links to the long-term vision of Ambition Act in 2040. So again, we presented the Philippine Development Plan differently now um, in terms of general themes rather than focusing on sectors. So that again, we see the, we see the coordination across um, different agencies um, within, within the different um, sectors. Second is intensification and institutionalization of engagement of citizens, CSOs, private sector, and other stakeholders in the planning process. Third is a stronger push and advocacy. Again, we, we, we want um, 
we want this um, in, uh, reform to take place, a stronger push and advocacy for synchronized planning and budgeting um, in the Development Budget Coordination Committee, which led to the current practice of considering the socioeconomic report in DBM's budget priorities framework. And um, uh, fourth would be, um, again, in terms of um, information technology and information systems, we basically we develop um, the we develop the public investment program online or people system for the submission programs and projects. So before from the manual submission, manual encoding of the different um, programs and projects enrolled by the different agencies um, in the public investment program, we now have um, a an online system to do this. Now, again, um, the theme um, of, of this um, year's um, um, DPRM is um, innovating governance for the new normal, and 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 basic and the, the new normal is really driven um, because of the the pandemic. And um, next slide, see, please. And we see this um, pandemic as a catalyst. Um, Dr. Tabuga said that it's an um, an impetus, but for, it's a it can also be viewed as a catalyst for change. And again, um, what has this, um, what are the elements of, of, of this pandemic? Next slide, please. Um, again, the, the pandemic has caused substantial disruptions in the domestic economy. Uh, and because of it, community restrictions that limit um, the movement of people and business operations were, in, were, in, were instituted. Again, there was a near shutdown of the domestic economy, especially in, in, um, in um, the national capital region and, uh, and the adjacent regions. And that has um, um, impacted our GDP growth of negative 9% in the first semester of 2020. And government has provided exceptional amount of social assistance and, and stimulus measures. Um, society, because of this, society and the economy will, will operate in the new normal, veering away from long-held manual and analog practices of both um, public and private sectors. And third, um, digitalization or digitization has increased in both public and private sectors to cope up with the present crisis. So while um, digitization or information technology is only one among the different um, innovations that are needed um, in, the pub in the public sector, um, this is, I think, one of the primary areas of response and innovation that um, we have to focus on. And again, um, it also um, it also reflects um, in terms of what are the 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 the, the, the focus of this um, year's DPRM in terms of info technology, civil service improvements, and smart systems. And all these three um, uh, would have an aspect of um, digitization and um, information technology um, within the overall um, digital economy of the Philippines. Next, please. Now we go into um, what are the current initiatives in promoting governance innovation um, currently? And uh, uh, these are the, the initiatives that are in Chapter 5 of the Philippine Development Plan. And among these are, next slide please. So when you look at when when you, when we when we look at um, chapter five of the Philippine Development Plan, we see these different reforms um, that are um, in the Philippine Development Plan, and and we feel that these reforms will also contribute 
to addressing the pandemic and again adapting to the new normal. First is broadening participatory governance to enable a whole of society approach in national and local planning through the development or utilization of mobile apps, media platforms, and geotagging technologies. And I, my, my colleague, um, ASEC Toledo, will be discussing part of this. Second is to accelerate implementation of the ease of doing business and efficient government service delivery app of 2018 to further streamline government services through automation of government processes, fast tracking of digitization of government frontline services, largely to support remote government operations, intensification of electoral reforms, including the integration of new election protocols, building smart and resilient public sector organizations, and future-ready public servants to capacity building initiatives and automation of HR processes, and um, strengthening of anti-corruption mechanisms through automation in complaints, evaluation, case management, and case inventory. So e even though um, we still didn't have the, 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 the COVID pandemic, there were already um, reforms that were um, um, planned um, to, um, that would contribute um, to um, addressing um, this the, the impact of the pandemic and more so now that these reforms would have to be accelerated um, by the different agencies um, or the different um, groups of agencies that are responsible for, for these innovations. One example uh, in terms of um, responding to the pandemic, um, next slide, is I'd like to, to um, to cite what Civil Service Commission has done, um, uh, which has helped the public sector cope up with the pandemic. Um, they instituted um, alternative work arrangements, and we have work from home, skeletal workforce, and staggered working hours. Second, they've um, instituted also occupational and health standards uh, in government workplaces. Next slide. We've also, Civil Service also instituted an ESAL and um, system, um, which now uh, makes it possible for um, all um, government employees and officials to um, to file and do the O taking um, required for their statement of um, assets, liabilities, and net worth online. They've instituted also online appointment system. And they've started to um, is, um, introduce digital learning and development. Again, these things were uh, in response to the pandemic, but hopefully, again, um, as we go to the new normal, um, more and more we will have to again ex um, expand um, all of these interventions and, and, and make them more holistic and um, scale them up. Now, as I said, um, looking at the different um, themes, sub themes of this year's um, this month's um, this year's um, DPRM, and basically again from the discussion of um, Dr. Sika on what what are the um, the best practices um, across the, the different countries they've, that they've um, studied in terms of infotech, civil service, and smart systems. Again, um, an important element here is our digital infrastructure. Um, and indeed, um, if we don't have that backbone, um, and if we don't have the, the basic um, processes and um, infrastructure and architecture that would support um, these innovations, then again, we are constrained um, in terms of the, the how radical um, and and um, and the scale of this innovation. So I'd like to um, quickly go on into um, again what what we have uh, identified as a challenge um, to institutional innovation, um, particularly um, again if you wanted to respond um, to the new normal. And this is this is um, 
um, the, uh, uh, the challenge to the, the digital economy um, of the Philippines? Can, can, can our um, digital economy respond to the needs um, for institutional innovation? Next slide, please. And next slide. And so these are the, the, the challenges, um, and and um, and uh, it's important now. And the ICT is doing this um, with other agencies. But again, these are in the the constraints that we have to address to facilitate um, institutional innovation across infotech and smart systems. First is um, um, our broadband broadband speed um, in the Philippines um, is one of the lowest among our Asian peers, and um, in 2019 um, we are in terms of um, we are um, 97 um, out of um, 207 in terms of our ranking. Again, we are. Um, below um we, we are below singapore malaysia thailand vietnam indonesia next please again also in pricing um we see that um again we are below um we are currently 80 out of um 206 countries and we are actually below um, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, even Malaysia. Well, Singapore is uh, expensive, but again, it's really expensive in Singapore. Um, the next one is um, some of the um, results that we got from the National ICT Household Survey. Again, this was released. Next slide, please. The, the National ICT Household Survey was conducted in 2017, but released only in 2019. And this shows, again, reach. If we want to develop systems, info, info systems, um, smart systems, it's important um, to look at the reach of um, our um, internet. Um, and um, again, um, the National ICT Household Survey shows that um, uh, we see the distribution and, and um, bulk of interviewed communities do not have telecommunications towers in their area. So practically more than 60% of, um, of the barangays. So these are barangays. 63.7% um, of the barangays um, are without any communications tower. And this is... Um, um more um um it's more in barm uh with 87.2 percent region five and region eight again um i think two weeks ago there was a joint um circular um issued by um dict and other agencies including arta that drastically um um, improve um, the, regula the regulation for putting up towers. So hopefully as we move along, um, these gaps in terms of um, putting up um, to communications towers um, will be um, uh, addressed. The next one is uh, fiber optic cables. Again, it's important to have um, to have um, your your towers um, but again in terms of the quality efficiency of um of um internet um fiber optic tables are superior to um uh, to mobile um, however um we see that um 70 percent of barangays do not have optic cables installed in their communities. And again, we see this um, in BARM, um, where 99% where of their barangays do not have, um, do not have um, installed fiber optic cables. Region 2 with 90.5%, and Mimaropa 
with 90.4%. And the third area, next slide please, is again um, in terms of inclusion um, uh, for free Wi-Fi. And we see that 87.8% um, of barangays that were surveyed um, um, do not have uh, free Wi-Fi. And again, it's for inclusion because if we are, if, if some of the innovations in terms of um, public service delivery, like um, education, like basic education, if you want to do that, um, do a lot of these innovations in terms of blended learning, online learning, um, then we need, uh, again, the infrastructure in the barangays, but we also need um, it um, to make this affordable and inclusive. So again, um, while we are um, doing a lot of things to, uh, to um, develop these systems, um, it's also important um, that there's reach um, and there's scope. And again, um, our constrained infrastructure for, for IT, um, again, um, would make the, the impact of our innovation suboptimal. And again, um, NEDA, NEDA collaborated with World Bank to come up with a digital economy report. Um, and we will be um, we, uh, we will be launching that digital economy report. It took us two years to do the report. Uh, we will be um, um, launching that in, within this month. And um, the next slide would show um, what are the three um, recommendations? Because a lot of the recommendations um, might take um, 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 a longer time. So what we're saying, what are the three um, top recommendations needed? Looking at the, the digital um, gaps in the Philippines, um, and we look at the, the top three. And the first one is to uh, make fast internet affordable and available to all Filipinos. And um, uh, the top one, uh, and this is streamlined permits for infrastructure provision and rationalized fees imposed by national and local government agencies as well as private sector organizations. The second would be um, digi digitize or digitalize government, process, government process, processes to promote social distancing and administrative efficiency. And again, we need um, to do this. We need to mandate um, government agencies to go digital by offering e permits and e payments. And the third is to make e commerce transactions safer and trustworthy. And among this, um, and, and, and the important thing to do here is to establish a strong consumer protection. Again, um, thank you very much. That was my presentation. And I'm looking forward to um, the presentations of my colleagues um, in today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asikalai, for your um, comprehensive um, uh, presentation. Asikalai mentioned about the um, initiatives of the Civil Service Commission uh, to help the public sector cope with the pandemic. Actually, we invited the CSC in today's um, uh, kickoff forum. However, they, they had to beg off because uh, they are busy with their own kickoff activities today because September is also the civil service month. So happy civil service uh, month to all. And of course, to our partner in the DPRM, the Civil Service Commission. Okay. Our next panelists will discuss two of the Department of Budget and Management's governance initiatives to promote more effective and efficient use of public funds. He is the Assistant Secretary of the Budget Policy and Strategy Group of the DBM. He directly oversees the operations of the Fiscal Planning Reform Bureau in its conduct of fiscal policy research and planning, development of fiscal and budgeting frameworks, formulation of annual and quarterly whole of government allotment and cash release programs and monitoring of macroeconomic developments and their impacts on the budget. He is also the official spokesperson of the department. Here now is Assistant Secretary Rolando Toledo of the DBM. Sir? All right. Uh, so good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Sheila. Yeah. 
Uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, PIDS uh, for arranging this uh, webinar, of course, to celebrate their 18th uh, Development Policy Research Month. So really, the theme is very uh, timely as well uh, as we all are grappling our way towards a new or a better normal. Uh, today, I will be discussing some ict jated uh, reforms that we have started to uh, initiate in the DBM and that may help us adapt the post-pandemic life. So the focus of my presentation will revolve around two key initiatives, that is the project uh, Digital Information for Monitoring and Evaluation or Project 9 and the Budget and Treasury Management System or the BTMS. So allow me now to discuss each of my more in details, uh, starting with the project line. So uh, year after year, government spending for infrastructure programs and projects continue to rise as we aim to boost the economic development and generate employment opportunities. So for 2021 alone, our infrastructure program is pegged at 1.12 trillion not but trillion equivalent to 5.4 percent of gdp so there is thus an increasing pressure to step up the implementation and monitoring of the big ticket items or projects through the establishment of a framework and methodology for monitoring and evaluation public spending so this is what project dime puts forward now project dime is a game changing initiative that utilizes existing technologies for monitoring and evaluation uh, of government projects. So concurrently, it allows uh, for direct uh, engagement with citizen, civics officials, and even our entire government agencies. So at the outset, uh, project time is anchored on three uh, key thrusts, uh, including results-based monitoring evaluation and reporting, and use of digital imaging technologies, or DDI, and of course, collaboration and partnership. Now, in 2018, uh, the DBM approved 12 big tickets uh, priority programs and projects that you saw on your screen in pilot run for this project time. So these pilot programs were further uh, uh, categorized uh, based on technology that would be used to monitor them. So under the first category are hard projects that are generally characterized by horizontal structure, including uh, roads, railways, irrigations, canals, and tree planting activities. So these projects have observable outputs that can be monitored remotely and addressed or assessed accurately. This will be the actual progress using the available resources. So, Technologies used to monitor these projects include satellite images and drones. So we are in that. Now, there are five pilot uh, pr uh, programs under this category, which includes access to roads, seaports and uh, seaports and airports, farm to market roads, north to uh, south commuter railway, new and existing irrigation system, and the national greening program of the DNR. Okay, so the second category uh, covers quite hard programs and projects that are generally uh, characterized by vertical structures such as the construction of buildings. Okay, uh, while these uh, projects tend to have an uh, observable output, kitang kita po natin yan, the available technology is still not sufficient to efficiently monitor the projects. Hence, uh, these site visits and validations are deemed necessary to accurate uh, as for accurate assessment and, of course, actual progress. So under this category, these are the following. Basic education facilities of DepEd, Silent Tubing Program of DILG, free Wi-Fi internet, access of DICT, health facilities and enhancement program of the DUH, and the National Fisheries Program Community Fish Landing Centers of the far now the, the third category includes uh, soft programs uh, and projects in which a uh, uh, basis of monitoring intangible assets including financial reports 
and grant, grants intended for beneficiaries. Uh, that is uh, satellite images and other available uh, digital data that we are. And of course, Im imaging technologies are not the right approach to use this monitoring this project. So ito po yung kasama. These are the Pantawid Familia Filipino programs of the DSWD and the uh, Universal Access to Quality Treasury Education of CHED. Okay. Now, the initial uh, implementation of project time has contributed to many gains for the national government. Yeah. Uh, it led to improve and timely uh, reporting of project performance, okay, and project uh, at the project site level. And with the data available uh, in DIME, DIME also renders programs for remote and on site validation of physical accomplishment. Also, both has been made uh, more systematic uh, through the use of prescribed M&E templates, okay? So for infrastructure projects, that is to, uh, of course, capture the complete and uh, the vital information uh, of our, of the uh, fiscal and financial performance parameters. It paved the way also uh, that our uh, implementing convergence programs to deepen conversations uh, and harmonize planning, implementation, and monitoring between agencies, uh, of course. And this has a lesson, of course, the uh, cost of implementation of uh, monitoring of programs. And of course, if not also to prevent the implementation issues and bottlenecks. It also intensifies uh, both uh, the awareness and importance of the monitoring and evaluation and conducting the program monitoring while maximizing the use of digital data imaging technologies. And also it led to uh, <coughs> the conceptualization of a uh, new monitoring system uh, prototypes that were specifically uh, developed to fit the design structure uh, uh, selected pilot program. So this is include the uh, monitoring assessment and planting uh, activities, uh, portal of the National Green Program of the DNR, and the RAIN, which is the remote assessment for irrigation network, which is the portal of the new for the new and existing irrigation system project of NIA. Now, aside from using existing technology monitoring pro, uh, the progress of big ticket uh, government project. Uh, project DIME also promotes participatory monitoring by tapping civil society organization or the CSOs, non-government organizations, and the citizens through crowdsourcing platforms. So one of these platforms is the Transparency DIME uh, website, which is aims to uh, solicit and provide feedback from and to the citizens and even NGOs, thereby, of course, uh, broadening the scope of the project time's monitoring capability. In fact, one of the uh, commitments of the DBM under the uh, Philippine Open Government Partnership Fifth National Action Plan through the transparency website, the DBM commits to establish uh, an effective and efficient and participatory monitoring, validation, and reporting mechanism for selected government infrastructure programs and projects under DPWH, DA, DEPED, and DIA. So, regular monitoring and reporting will uh, facilitate uh, the generation of uh, timely and relevant information of uh, the performance of government programs and projects and the problems that del uh, delay the implementation. So now uh, detection and potential problems at an early stage will enable the implementing agencies uh, concerned to uh, what? Undertake necessary steps and actions for the immediate proper and proper resolution. Now, uh, currently, the DBM is crafting the business process manual for the said website and will launch the interactive time transparency website uh, most likely by July next year. Now, meanwhile, to uh, 
highlight some of the civic engagement milestones that have uh, been recently uh, achieved by the Project Dine team. So uh, as part of the commitment to the Open Government Partnership, the Project Dime team participated in the Dagyao OGP Regional Dialogues and Unhost Sessions as resource for speakers in various locations across the country last 2019. So for the Project Dime uh, team was also invited to share its initiative on transparency through the civic technology during the 2020 Transparency Caravan and Freedom of Information Conference for LGUs that we spearheaded, that were uh, spearheaded by the PCOO. Now, uh, moving forward, the Project Time team will continue to uh, uphold its commitment in the promote transparency and accountability through the use of available technology and participatory monitoring. So, it vows to have more open and participatory governance uh, that will pull uh, at any government undertaking to issue or, or assure them that they are part of improving the bureaucracy. Okay. Now, moving on, another ICT uh, digital reform that is being undertaken by the DBM uh, is, being, is the budget and treasury management system or what we call the BDMS. Okay, so the BDMS is a centralized database which uh, records real-time information on financial transactions across government agencies. So with this capability, transactions are mapped real-time from cradle to grave, or in other words, from purchase to payment. So a key objective of the BTS is to achieve the future state of public financial management uh, PFM, where all spending agencies would capture government transactions at source using this BMS system as the sole accounting fiscal reporting system. And then what the oversight agencies will need is just to uh, fetch and generate these reports at near real time from the BTMS. Now, 2018 to uh, 2019, uh, the BTMS was able to cover 12 agencies, including DBM. That is uh, uh, DBM, then BTR, we have DBWH, we have BTI, DSWD, DICT, uh, NCP, EMB, DNB, DNB, and PAGASA, and the Bank State University. So thereby capturing 30.98% of total expenditures based on their allotments or shares in the fiscal year 2020 General Appropriation Act. So for the BTMS targeted to bring board an additional 23 agencies, which will enable system to capture 50.53% of total expenditure of this year's budget. So the remaining uh, agencies, meanwhile, will be covered, uh, of course, uh, at a staggered approach until 2025. So the interface between the S and the modernized Philippine uh, Government Electronic Procurement System, or FieldJEPS, is also targeted to be completed in 2020, uh, fortifying the link between planning, procurement, and of course, budget utilization. So, uh, as we are currently in the middle of the health crisis, our day-to-day -day operations in the government have so much So, most of us had no choice but to implement alternative work uh, force arrangement in order for us to ensure the safety of all employees. Now. Uh, the BTMS, uh, being a comprehensive digital system uh, for, uh, that can be accessed remotely at any point in time, provides a safe platform for government agencies to include its financial transaction while staying guarded from exposure to virus. Now, uh, earlier on, I just uh, uh, note of the uh, uh, previous speakers of 
having an institution, harmonization, collaboration, and coordination with other foreign agencies. Now, leveraging information communication technology will enable sound database policy decision responding to threats of COVID-19. So you will look here that uh, we have provided under the MIT. Okay. By the way, MIT is uh, uh, the uh, what we call the it's a process that harmonizes and ensures interoperability among ICT-related resources, programs, and projects across the government. So as a policy. The implementing agencies are required to submit to the DICT their respective three-year information strategic system plan for endorsement to the Miki Steering Committee composed of DICT, DBM, and NEDA. So, in a way, uh, as far as national government agencies, this really a collaboration, coordination, and harmonization of this ICT uh, technology. So, as a matter of fact, for the 2021 budget, we have provided 21.4 billion. Will likewise uh, will be allocated to ICD expenditures. That is to improve uh, Wi-Fi broadband infrastructure and develop e-platform and online system to support the e-governance initiative of different departments. So, specifically, uh, the uh, 9.4 billion will be provided for. The ICT sustainability expense, 1.9 billion for ICT support for financial inclusion, 2.5 billion for other ICT expense expenses under governance, and take note of this, 7.6 billion for ICT expenditures to adapt to the new normal. Okay. Now, in closing, uh, I would like to emphasize that DBM fully supports the role of technology-driven initiatives in addressing the challenges we are currently facing and the, uh, and the future risks that are yet to come. So we also hope that through the, both the Project Dime and DTMS, we are able to promote effective, transparent, and open governance. So uh, I will end from that. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Rolly Toledo of the DBM. For our next presentation, we will take a look at financial technology or fintech innovations. In recent months, uh, since the onset of the pandemic, we have witnessed a surge in fintech adoption by both consumers and business owners. And in this next presentation, our panelists from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas will talk about the bank's initiatives to enhance uh, financial inclusion in the country to accelerate the uptake of fintech innovations. She will discuss the bank's initiatives. She will also discuss the bank's initiatives to um, mitigate the impact of, co of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our panelist is the assistant a governor of the monetary policy subsector, which is in charge of the formulation and recommendation of monetary and uh, financial policies, conduct of research in economic and financial forecasting, generation, and dissemination of monetary, financial, and external sector statistics, and implementation of economic and financial learning and information programs. She's a graduate of Bachelor of Science in, in Statistics from the UP and holds a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University as a World Bank scholar. Friends, uh, BSB Assistant Governor Illuminada Sikal, ma'am. Assistant Governor Sika? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, okay. ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you, Char. Uh, Dr. Char, good morning to my fellow presenters, senior officials, and fellow workers from the government, and all other participants who are tuned in to this webinar. Uh, on behalf of BSP Governor Benjamin Giocno, I would like to thank the PIDS for inviting the BSP to take part uh, to take part in this kickoff event in the celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. Um, allow me, uh, for my presentation, allow me first to give you a snapshot of the Philippine economy before and during the onslaught of the pandemic, as well as highlight the major policy measures implemented by the BSP to address the financial 
volatilities brought about by the pandemic and the quarantine measures. And then I will discuss the BSP's financial innovation and inclusion agenda, including uh, observed developments related to uh, digital transformation and their uh, drivers during the pandemic. Now, uh, flashing your screen um, is the Philippine macroeconomic uh, uh, state uh, from the last three decades, from 1991 to the second half of uh, 2020. It benchmarks the economic performance of the Philippines during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is late, uh, labeled here as C-19 in the chart against the 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis and the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, this chart presents the output growth and unemployment, uh, which have been uh, significantly affected by the pandemic. However, since we entered the crisis with strong macroeconomic conditions, we have maintained our resilience. Uh, just to put emphasis that uh, unlike in the Asian financial crisis, when the U.S. and other advanced economies was able to uh, buttress global demand, uh, the current health crisis is spared no one. All economies are in the same stormy sea with different levels of policy space, financial resilience, and global interconnectedness. Interconnect this is a crisis like no other, as the IMF usually called it. Indeed, COVID-19 pandemic is shaping the macroeconomic landscape in uh, the Philippines. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. At the onset of the pandemic, the BSP acted swiftly and decisively and communicated its priorities and policies to help ease domestic liquidity and credit conditions, as well as maintain confidence in the domestic uh, financial market. The BSP implemented a number of policy measures ranging from the usual liquidity enhancing measures, such as cuts in uh, policy rates and reduction in reserve requirement, the grant of time-bound regulatory relief measures to financial institutions to allow them in turn to extend the same relief to their clients and the adoption of a number of non-standard measures such as the repo, uh, repurchase agreement with the national government. Now, uh, let me now move to the main topic, to my main topic. Now, in addition to uh, the policy measures of the BSP, uh, the BSP has also undertaken a proactive stance in its strategy towards digital transformation to address the impact of the pandemic. The BSP is approaching the digital transformation initiative through a sandbox approach or the test and run approach where we adopt a flexible, open, and enabling regulatory stance rather than stifling potential, particularly those supporting our advocacies for a secure, robust, resilient and more inclusive financial system. There are four assets of the di uh, digital imperative for the new economy, namely the infrastructure, a verifiable digital identity, digital skills, and the enabling regulatory framework, in particular with respect to open banking. Uh, next slide. With the, the, the BSP's experience with the pandemic, has shown the critical role of digital platforms in uh, financial transactions and in the economy in general. Specifically, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the use of digital payment platforms as shown by the marked increase in the electronic fund transfers against the reduction both in ATM withdrawals and check operations. Now, according to data gathered by the BSP Center for Learning and Inclusion Advocacy, a noticeable decline in ATM withdrawals and check transactions was observed during the 76-day lockdown from March to May. During the period, people transact more using digital platforms such as online bank transfers or through the Instapay and PesoNet to conduct their payment transactions. Without the vaccine that will prevent the spread of the virus, we expect the increasing trend in digital transfer, uh, uh, transactions to continue even as lockdown measures are eased. The continued waiver of transaction fees for the use of Instapay and PesoNet, as well as the government's initiative uh, to distribute social amelioration benefits through electronic and digital means will significantly boost the greater use of digital payment platform. The BSP targets to increase the adoption of electronic retail payments 
to 50% of the total retail volume transactions by 2023. Just to compare, based on the 2019 Better Than Cash Alliance study using 2018 data, the share of digital payments is estimated to be 10% by volume. Uh, by volume and 20% uh, by value in 2018. So that's where we are uh, uh, in 2018. But uh, we are expecting these to increase rapidly as we move forward. Now the BSP also takes a more active role in pushing for the implementation of the Philippine National ID system in collaboration with the Philippine Statistics Authority and other agency agencies to uh, establish a ver verifiable uh, digital identity for Filipinos, which will enable them to open bank accounts, use uh, financial services more efficiently, and gainfully participate in an increasingly digital economy. Uh, next slide. The BSP accelerated further the digital transformation of the financial services sector in preparation for the new economy arrangement. This is done through the proper regulation and oversight of the payment, uh, uh, payment system as mandated by the <clears throat> National Payment System Act. The BSP is ready, uh, uh, the BSP is ready to apply the recently approved principles-based payment system oversight framework which is the main policy that implements the National Payment System Act. The existence of the PESONET and the InstaPay, the current two automated clearing houses, facilitated two key milestones, uh, initiative of the National Retail Payment System or the NRPS. These include the government e-payment facility or the e pay by a PESONET, and um, the National Quick Response Code Standard, or QRPH, via the InstaPay. The eGovPay facility has digitized the government collection and disbursements, leading to more efficient government collection receipts, better audit, enhanced transparency, and eventually curve revenue lifts. Meanwhile, the adoption of the National uh, QR Standard, or the QRPH, as provided under BSP Circular Number 1005, has transformed the fragmented QR-driven payment services into interoperable payment solutions, thereby eliminating the need for merchants and customers to maintain several accounts and for the merchants to display numerous QRs. Recognizing that digital payments are enabler of digital transformation, the BSP is promoting the use of PESONET as a viable alternative to checks and recurring bulk, bulk payments, while InstaPay as a substitute for cash. As of uh, July 31, 2020, PESONET has uh, 60 participating uh, financial institutions, while InstaPay has 47. This means that one can have access to this ACH through these participating financial institutions. Now, uh, the next slide, in the next slide, uh, shows uh, a growing preference for digital transactions. Uh, more clients of payment service providers have been leveraging on the benefits of PESONET and InstaPay. Since these services provide more uh, efficient, safe, uh, efficient, safe, and uh, convenient ways of making payments and transferring funds, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. A comparison of the performance of the two payment solutions for Q1 and Q2 2020, shown in this slide as those of the two upper charts, indicated that their combined transactions further accelerated in Q2 2020 when many areas in the country were placed under enhanced community quarantine beginning mid-March uh, this year. The combined transaction of these two automated clearing houses increased by 122% and 59% in terms of volume and value, respectively. Specifically, in the case of PESONET, uh, the spike in the value uh, shown on the upper right uh, chart, um, the spike in the value was 
uh, partly attributed to the financial assistance extended by the SSS to micro and uh, medium enterprises in May 2020 that was forced by a PESONEP. This upward trend demonstrates that more and more clients of payment service providers have been leveraging on the benefits of PESONEP and InstaPay. This was uh, further accelerated with the waiver of PESONEP and InstaPay transfer fees of the major PSP since the ECQ. On the other hand, uh, the surge in EGOB pay transactions reflects the deepening public awareness of this digital facility as a safe and efficient means of payment for taxes, licenses, permits, and other obligations to the government, as evidenced by a marked increase of 688% and 799% uh, in volume and value since its launch in November 2019 up to June 2020. We also note that the number of government dealers enrolled in this facility considerably expanded from just two when it went live in November 2019 to 277 as of uh, June 2020. The BIR has been the top uh, biller followed by the Philippine National Police, the Environmental Management Bureau, and the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration. Meanwhile, the lower chart on the right uh, shows the demand and supply of QR-enabled payment services, which have likewise been showing promising trends. The volume and value of person-to-person transactions showed a sharp growth of 1,214% and 1,374% in terms of volume and value respectively. Given the bullish expectations on the P2P QRPH or uh, QR coding, there are 12 more BSP supervised financial institutions that, that are set to launch this payment facility within the year. This is on top of the existing eight financial institutions already currently enrolled. Now in the next slide, uh, it presents the opportunities and challenges in promoting the use of digital payments in the Philippines as identified in the 2019 Financial Inclusion Survey. Uh, the results of this survey actually confirms many of the indicators presented earlier by ASEC Kaloy, such as in terms of internet speed, broadband pricing, and quality and reach of internet connection. The 2019 Financial Inclusion Survey shows that of the 69% of adults with a mobile phone and 53% of them use the internet, there are only 12% of mobile uh, phone users and 9% of internet users who use their mobile phones and internet for financial transactions. Moreover, 7 in 10 unbanked adults have a mobile phone which represents an untapped opportunity for digital finance. The survey also pointed out that two of the major challenges to the use of uh, digital payments are lack of awareness and trust in making mobile or online payment transactions and the digital divide. Specifically, 6 in 10 adults in urban areas are smartphone owners and internet users, compared to 4 in 10 in rural areas, while 7 in 10 adults in uh, Metro Manila have a smartphone and use the internet. This figure drops in areas outside the capital, particularly in Luzon. The ratio is 6 to 10, 6 uh, individuals. Uh, in 10. In Visayas, 4 in 10. And in Mindanao, 3, uh, 3 in 10. Since uh, lack of awareness and trust remain to be the main barriers to usage of mobile phone and internet for financial transactions, the BSP believes that promoting digital literacy plays a crucial role in deepening the public's trust in digital finance services. Similarly, widely uh, shared access to affordable and fast internet connection, along with the uh, universal access to a digital ID under the Philippine I uh, Identification System, or PhilSYST, will facilitate the scale and reach of digital financial services. 
Uh, in the next slide, uh, the BSP's financial inclusion initiatives are focused on promoting the inclusive di uh, digital finance approach that consists of the following features. Okay, one is easier access to a bank account by expanding access to basic deposit account or BDA, uh, as well as uh, increase or expanding access to e-money account. BDA has a minimum opening balance of no more than 100 pesos, no maintaining balance, and can deposit up to 50,000. Two is the expansive network of low-cost touch points by allowing more cash agents as well as e-money agents for easy access to financial services, such as remittance transfers. Third is the efficient retail payment system through PesoNet and InstaPay, eGovPay, and QRPH. Thus far, uh, substantial gains have been achieved as shown by the encouraging uh, statistics shown in this slide. Ownership of a formal account is a basic indicator of financial inclusion. We have seen an expansion of basic deposit account, low-cost touch points, and retail payment transactions. Now, um, for my last slide, in closing, Allow me to highlight two main points from my presentation. First, the pandemic highlighted the need for and preference towards a safe and efficient electronic payments and settlement system in the country. The BSP has been in the forefront of these innovations. Second, the BSP remains committed together with the national government in implementing the necessary policy measures and reforms including the facilitation of digital transformation to help the Philippine economy recover from the COVID-19 crisis and to build its resilience against future crises. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to more discussions on innovating governance for the new normal. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Governor Sikat of the BSP. Our forum this morning will not be complete. You will not hear the insights of our local governments, which are at the forefront of the pandemic response. And we are privileged to have with us today a local chief executive who will share how the local uh, government she is heading has embraced technology in the time of the pandemic to provide more effective and efficient service to its constituents. Our panelist is a lawyer who has served in both the legislative and executive branches of government. She first joined the political arena as representative of Makati's second district from 2007 to 2016 and was elected as mayor in May 2016, where she prioritized the integration of modern technology into the systems and operations of the city government to promote transparency and enhance the city's overall competitiveness. Now on her second term, she continues to lead Makati's transformation into, an, into a technology embracing smart city that is sustainable and resilient, as well as a model of inclusive progress and development. Friends, Mayor Marlene Abigail S. Binay. Ma'am? Hi, good, afternoon. good morning to everyone. Um, I think it's but, it's but proper that I complete the entire cycle uh, on a local government um, perspective. In 2016, I immediately instituted reforms and innovations in the programs and operations of the city government to make services more accessible and convenient. I believe that leaders and citizens should embrace new technology, especially during, even at the time there was not a pandemic yet, because it provides convenience, but it also promotes public health by avoiding physical contact. So, um, we instituted a contactless distribution of financial assistance using the Makati Zen card and the Makati Zen app. Um, this, we were actually the first one that did this. Uh, under the Makati Zen Economic Relief Program, each qualified Makati Zen will receive 5,000 from the city government. We initially targeted 500,000 Makati Zens, so we had to allocate a budget of 2.7 billion. As of August 25, we have already distributed to 348,000 
262 Makati Zens or over 1.9 billion. And uh, we, we also distributed through contactless distribution to 7,310 Makati City Hall employees their anniversary bonus. We distributed cash incentives to our graduates of public elementary and senior high school um, ranging from 1,000 to 5,000 pesos. We, we gave 11 graduates 7,000, 107 graduates with high honors 5,000, 2,499 graduates with honors 3,000, and the rest or the remaining graduates, which were 9,278 graduates, received 1,000 or a total of 9.2. So we gave uh, through contactless distribution a total amount given to our graduates of 17.39 million. After we have distributed our Makatulong 5,000, I'm very proud to say that we have a very entrepreneurial citizens. Um, Mr. Mauro Luta of Barangay Valenzuela is actually a welder. And because of the inconvenience of traveling to work, he decided to, he was forced to resign. And he used his 5,000 pesos as cash assistance to generate a sustainable income for him and his family. So he's now earning around five, minimum of 500 pesos a day. He used his welding skills to create his own fish ball cart, um, and he now has a regular source of income. He actually took the vocational course of welding in our university several years ago, and he, I feel, served an, an example of hope and resilience to all of us. So, siya po yung gumamit ng pera ng 5,000 na ginawa po niyang pangkabuhayan. Uh, to address the issue of uh, education, uh, because we are not allowed to give face-to-face uh, face -face classes, we are bridging the educational gap through technology. We are not giving away tablets, but we are giving away learners pack for 85,000 public school students. I was just informed by my DepEd superintendent that we will now have to increase and procure an additional um, 3,900 uh, because of the influx of enrollees in our city. Learner's Pack contains the on-the-go flash drive, which you simply install in any gadget, whether it be a cell, a cell phone, a uh, TV, or a uh, laptop or iPad. And in this flash drive, there are, it contains the digital modules. We also gave printed modules in case you don't have a gadget. We're, we're giving away uh, washable face masks and a daily five-hour internet load. The free laptop and internet load uh, is also given to 2,500 public school teachers. And we also procured turnstiles with thermal scanners to monitor the temperature of students in case we do start to allow kids to come back to school. How am I how am I able to provide the five hour uh, free internet? Because we have a PPP in 2016 for the uh, laying of fiber optics uh, throughout the city. So we were able we were able to build the infrastructure early on that that is now being used to provide the necessary adjustments to our children. So we also provided a um, initial livelihood program for our 27 GP drivers who lost their means of livelihood uh, by providing a city's mobile learning hub project. The mobile learning hub project is supposed to help, actually the initial concept is to help students. Uh, it's like a tutorial program for our students who do not have gadgets or are a bit having difficulty in school. So we will be using uh, GP drivers. We, are, we will be renting the Jeeps and we will use them uh, in the barangays. We will practice safe distancing. We will, uh, the Jeepneys are outfitted to transport books, learning materials. We also had to hire, uh, we were also able to provide um, additional income for displaced teachers 
Um, and we will also put laptops with internet connection inside a Jeep. So the city coordinated with the Makati Jeepney Operations and Drivers Association for the rent of the 27 jeepneys, which includes the driver. And we are looking at um, 100 drivers per week eventually because we will be rotating. So the Makati Mobile Learning Hub project is a learning platform focused on ensuring that the youth of Makati will continue learning in spite of the risks and restrictions of the pandemic. We also, we also have efforts to prevent the spread of disease by instituting the teleconsultations in hospital na Makati. Instead of going to OSMAC uh, for our outpatient department, they may now go to OSMAC's e-consult website and choose the mode of consultation, whether audio or video consultation. This is a local, local homegrown teleconsultation that was done by the Hospital ng Makati. Another thing that I can be proud of is um, we, the city was able to provide a locally sourced, it was actually the University of Makati who developed, the COVID-19 platform. This platform uh, can be used for case investigation, patient symptom observation, and contact tracing. The dashboard shows the number of confirmed cases, deaths, recoveries, and trends, and data can be sorted by age group, gender, and barangay. So this, is a, this was done by uh, the University of Makati. So we also partnered with uh, My Legal Wiz and Idalao for persons deprived of liberty, wherein um, 500 free credits for 400,000 Makati Zens and business owners in the city who need legal, legal advice and documents in the midst of the COVID 19 pandemic. They can use the credits to access the features of My Legal Wiz, including Ask Leia, our legal engineer assistant, which helps users in doing legal research. We have also been able to provide um, for the EDALA 1,300 to 1,356 persons deprived of liberty. Again, um, because of the lockdown, I felt that I was very concerned with the, the influx of people that will eventually pay their, pay their taxes um, when the when we eased the community quarantine, so we launched. This is ito po ano lang um, last minute po namin to ginawa. We launched a contactless portal, payment portal. So business establishments who have yet to pay their business taxes and the real property taxes can can pay without having to go to city hall. So um, we are trying to institute ways to incur to Give services, give services online, and discourage people to leave their homes. So this contactless payment system uh, eliminates the need to physically go to city hall and queue for tax payments. So we will be, we will also be expanding other features for our online tax payments. So, sa so niyo, paano nagmi-meeting yung city council? Paano nagmi-meeting yung NCDC? We, are, we also conduct our AIP um, meetings and our budget hearings. We, will, we all conduct that through teleconferencing. So our curfew ordinance, our, our ban on drinking liquor, the mandatory of wearing of face masks, the anti-discrimination ordinance for health workers and the hazard pay for our frontliners were all done uh, via teleconferencing. Lastly, we use social media to handle public concerns and disseminate information on COVID-19. So as of today, we have around 403,000 followers on Facebook, 128,000 followers on Twitter. So we answer concerns about financial assistance, the solution of food packs, all concerns. Um, minsan hindi pa usap taga Makati yung nagko-comment, pero... Um, this is a way for us to be close to our constituents despite the restrictions of uh, the pandemic. So, thank you very much and I hope you learned something from 
the city of Makati. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor uh, Abigail Dina. Very informative presentations from our uh, panelists. And at this point, it is now time to entertain questions from our participants. So for our open forum, may, in, may we invite our uh, presenters from PIDS, Dr. Tabuga and Sika, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Tabuga and Dr. Siket, and their co-authors, Dr. Sani Domingo and uh, Dr. Val Ulip. And of course, our panelists, Asik Kaloy Abad Santos of NEDA, Asik Rolly Toledo of the DBM, um, Assistant Governor uh, Illuminada Siket of the PSP, and Mayor Abby B. Knight. So please turn on your videos so that our audience can see you. Okay, so let us now uh, start entertaining questions from our WebEx uh, participants. And uh, may I direct this question to um, Dr. Sikat and Dr. Tabuka? And of course, their co-authors can, can also answer this because this concerns your your study, the literature you presented. And Norris Falguer, one of our uh, WebEx participants, commented that uh, most of the innovations you cited in your presentation are foreign innovations. Uh, he's asking if uh, if there are there are no uh, Philippine-based uh, innovations that you did, did not see in the literature, and um, if there is any framework or mechanism for the for uh, Filipinos themselves to um, develop these innovations and for the Philippines to adopt innovations from abroad and suit them to the Philippine situation. Um, one of you can answer this. Um, I'll go ahead. Yes. Thank yes, you. Charlotte. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, as you heard from Mayor Dine, that there are innovations done that were done here during the time of the pandemic as we're adjusting to it now. And we cited this also in the smart systems um, uh, sub theme of the of the conference. And apart from that, we also wanted to highlight just like uh, Asset Kaloyabad Santos and as evidenced by the efforts at the DBM and at the central bank, that it is actually a whole of government approach. The issues that we raised, especially when it came to institutional innovations, dealt primarily with how to implement, um, in particular, um, let's say, the national ID, the PILSIS Act, and overcome the data privacy issues, as well as implement the National Broadband Act, and free public internet access to public areas, as well as improve the Notifiable Diseases Act. So all of these um, require some sort of tweaking in order for them to be aligned. The yes. DSWD in our paper, you will see, they were able to overcome issues in data privacy because they issued guidelines for data sharing so that it would be easy to vet who the beneficiaries are. But what it's nice to know in the case of the central bank that their efforts are for digi digital inclusion and not just financial inclusion. Yes. Because we want mm -hmm. the money to get to the um, the poorest of the poor, those who are hard up um, affected by this pandemic, as in the case of Makati City here, where there are contactless um, distribution of their assistance programs. So that's that's really what we want. So it's not just you know in a silo. It's mm -hmm. a whole of government and overcoming the limitations of the different existing laws that are there and coming up with creative solutions. So okay. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to talk about oh. that. Perhaps we can hear from, from Sunny. Mm -hmm. Sunny, would you like to add to that? Quick um, quick response. Right. Uh, yes, Sheila. Good morning to everybody. Um, that in our paper, we highlighted several uh, global experiences when it comes to innovation. But all of those actually have local counterparts. So we may have missed, for example, elaborating on certain local uh, innovations when it comes to governance. But our panelists, our uh, current speakers actually elaborated on some of them. So it's really us uh, trying to augment what we have right now and probably uh, having standards being uh, set globally as uh, probably milestones in terms of our progression, uh, our local progression. So uh, I get what the uh, the person asking the question was uh, referring to, but really we can look at our local uh, setting and actually get very, very good uh, examples of innovation governance-wise. Thank you, Sheila. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sunny. Now let's proceed to the next question. If I may address this uh, uh, to uh, uh, Mayo Binay and for ASEC Abad. And this one is from Isabella Luis Abustan of the Social Finance Housing Corporation. Um, she said with the feasibility, okay, there is a clamor for ramping up digital infrastructure for the, for the new normal in the Philippines. With the feasibility of resources aside, uh, I would like to know if there is readiness in both national and local government institutions to guarantee adequate digital literacy and acceptability on the part of program implementers and program recipients. Um, I think those factors should should also be considered, she said. May we have your thoughts on, on this, Mayor Binay? And then we can go to ASEC, uh, de los, uh, ASEC Abad Santos. Of course. Um... Even if you have the technology, if your if the manpower or your teachers, or your students are not yes. uh, digitally literate, Digital. or, um, it will all go to waste. No matter what high tech gadget you have, if um, if your students don't don't know how to um, navigate through it, uh, mm -hmm. it will be useless. So in the city of Mac, as far as the city of Makati is concerned, we constantly conduct. Um, we actually did a, a, um, a test run for our teachers because our teachers are also not familiar with the use mm -hmm. of uh, technology. So for the University of Makati, we had to do um, we had to do training for our teachers, and we also had to institute or place a tech support mm -hmm. um, and uh, recruit students that are tech savvy. To also teach their co-students mm -hmm. because med language barrier then eh. um, if you talk support and your teachers or uh, to your citizens it is difficult with technology um, the number one challenge for the city of Makati and I think it is not peculiar to the city of Makati, but to, to even globally, is the issue for uh, senior citizens that are not very tech literate. Uh, they are not very comfortable with embracing technology. That um, how do you how do you simplify it for them to be included in the change in the transition to digital to embrace digital technology? So. Uh, that's still the biggest factor for the city as far as the city is concerned. Marami po kami mga seniors that are, that prefer to write, and, I mean, even for contact tracing, marami po that don't want to use their their phones to register when they go into a restaurant. They prefer logging in, writing, writing on the piece of paper. So, mm -hmm. kasi wala po sa smartphone. So, those are things that, um, we, re we really need to, you also always need to keep your human resource updated. Yes. That's a, mm -hmm. That's a very good point, Mayor Abby. And Asik Kaloy, if we may, uh, if you may uh, share your thoughts on uh, on that question regarding uh, the readiness of our national um, agencies uh, with regard to uh, guaranteeing adequate uh, lit digital literacy and acceptability. Yeah, um, one of the, the results um, um, in, um, in the in the digital economy report, one of the findings there um, is that when they look at the readiness of the different sectors for the digital economy, um, it's actually government um, compared to private sector na medyo, ano, that um, are, um, are less ready. Um, we see the private sector a, a, a doing a lot of these um, solutions already. Um, and and um, government is less um, ready compared to um, the private sector. So again, um, it's important um, to um, address this um, through capacity building, as as, as Mayor um, Binay said. Na um, again across the different um, agencies um, and across different sectors, teachers, um, uh, among others, uh, even even the different agencies. Um, Again, it's important to look at um, um, infrastructure, which is important, but second also capacity. 
because even though if you have the infrastructure ready, if you have the, the already the, the gadgets available, but if um, your um, human resource um, um, cannot um, maximize the use of all of this, then and then then we won't be able to um, again um, deliver um, that service um, uh, as much as we want to, particularly um, again um, using um, using um, digital um, technologies to deliver these services. Thank you, thank you, Asik Abad Santos. Uh, if if I may go back to you, um, Mayor Binay, uh, we have a question here from. Uh, Roxanne Yap, uh, one of our WebEx participants. Um, she said that uh, it is good to know that LGUs like Makati have all these projects that's taking advantage of digital technologies. Are there efforts to get all this information out there for other LGUs to learn from and be inspired to undertake similar projects? Meron bang mga sharing na nagaganap among uh, yeah, mga chief, local chief executives like you to share best, best practices, ma'am? Mayor? Uh, I know, Mayor. We, we always are. Hello, ma'am. Well, um, Metro, Imaganda yung Willos. Okay, Sigi Pop, ma'am. That would okay. be better, Sigi Pop. So, um, we constantly do benchmarkings with other cities. Mm -hmm. um, we also participate in a lot of forums to share what we have been doing for the city. Constantly naman po yung, um, yung communication namin along with, among uh, NCR mayors. So, um, we, are, we are loud and proud to share all the initiatives mm -hmm. we have been conducting for the city. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Binay. Uh, the, yes? I'd like to add something to that. If, okay. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting because it really is um, the, when we talk about capacity building, it deals with behavioral really. And that's why it, earlier we emphasized also in our presentation, one of the successes was that there was a growth and learning mindset in innovations in governance in the public sector reforms, let's say in Singapore. And that that has to be adopted. But also um, Assistant Governor uh, Sikat also mentioned earlier that there are certain issues as well as trust in the digital um, mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. digital literacy. So that is also an aspect that has to be addressed. Perhaps how to build trust in the digital digital platforms and the financial institutions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Justine, uh, for that additional information. Okay, the next set of questions is for um, well, there's the, the presentation is uh, of um, of um, Asa Toledo has uh, has attracted uh, much interest from our uh, participants, and um, may we address this uh, questions to you, sir? Um, okay, this one is from Isabella Luis Abustan again, and uh, his asking if uh, it is possible to in, uh, to uh, include government government housing programs in the project dime that's one and the next one is referring to the btms i think is there a similar monitoring system for the lgus and this uh, that question is from reggie salonga the third is from janet cuenca what reports can be generated from the project dime uh, then from Malu Ortiz, can METI be used for locally funded projects as part of LGU's uh, new normal innovations? And then finally from the Dagus Ustin, can BTMS detect fraud? Okay, sige sir, isa isahin po natin. Medyo madami. <laughs> Maraming ano, interesado po sa ano, mga initiatives na ng BBM. Sir, your microphone po, kindly turn it on. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, Carry sir. On. Okay, mandami nga. Okay. Oo nga, sir. Okay. So, okay. Uh, can, can, um, can government housing programs be included okay. in the Project Dime? Nakuha ko naman yun. So, okay. Now, in terms of that Project uh, Dime as to uh, 
uh, if the, the government could include the housing program. You know, we can take a look at that in uh, considering to uh, look at that program to be included in the dam. But I just want to emphasize that in selecting programs and projects to be included in the project, uh, uh, we have to have you know, what we call uh, the criteria that we use. Uh, these are as follows. Uh, these are as follows. Mm -hmm. So, program prioritization, magnitude of funds, uh, weak performance, and reach and impact of the program of the national nationwide level. I think qualifies don. So we have to uh, take a look. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second one, if there's a similar monitoring system for the LGUs. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Currently, uh, the DLG has what we call the Deb Live app mm -hmm. that includes the monitoring of LGU projects. Ay, maganda ito kasi it's not only the government who can participate in the monitoring, but also the CSOs where the project is located that they can monitor. They can take a look and they can have a picture and even submit it to the uh, DILG. So there's also a plan, an ongoing plan here to integrate this two. Uh, uh, up, which is the project time and uh, deb light. Okay. okay. Now, in terms of the uh, uh, question, I think uh, of Miss Quenka from Yes, yes. yes. What yeah. reports can be generated yeah. from the project time, sir? Yes, right. So the project uh, releases uh, an annual report that summarizes mm -hmm. the results and findings of programs for monitoring under dime. For example, uh, for the road projects, comparison of physical accomplishments based on the numbers reported by the implementing agency can be matched with the values, of course, using the physical accomplishments measured using satellite image processing yeah. to project. So there's a uh, ginagawan po yan ng time series para maano rin siya, makita natin kung nag improve ba siya or hindi. So, yung po yung isang ano. Uh, I think uh, right now, this report can be requested nga lang through email, but there's also an ongoing efforts uh, to upgrade the time transparency website to include these reports in the form of a dashboard and mm -hmm. will allow uh, users to interact with the data uh, dynamically. So, well, in we we want to uh, enhance this one, and probably you can expect this uh, by the first half of the 2021. Okay, that's good to know, sir. Okay, okay. next question: Yung can MITHI be used for locally funded projects as part of LGU's new normal innovations? Ah, uh, yung MITHI po uh, is uh, ano yan, actually uh, uh, MITHI is sabi ko nga kanina is a process that harmonizes and ensures interoperability of uh, among ICT uh, resources, programs, and projects across government. So, mm -hmm. look, in fact, po yan lahat halos, okay? Yung projects na yan nandyan, uh, except for those funded ng uh, our uh, development partners. So, yes, we can include that. Kasi ito po ay listahan po. What is in that budget, the ICT budget, is the list of programs from agencies, implementing agencies. Actually, dyan, uh, uh, ano dyan, related to that, uh, Dr. Sheila, I just want to answer you isang nakita ko dito sa chat box that malaki yata daw yung budget dito. Okay. Oh, oh, sir. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, uh, yung budget po dyan is, ano, it's not just for one particular ICT project. It's an implement ICT projects of all national government agencies. At mm -hmm. ang pinakalaki na project, the ICT project, is yung Philippine Identification System natin, yung sa being implemented. Yung national ID system. Yes, it's a national ID. That yes. is 1.72 billion. And then we mm -hmm. have also the telecommunication infrastructure of 4.7 billion. Yan po yung the for implementation ng DICT on the national broadband uh, broadband plan para hindi mm -hmm. na hirap ngayon kita mo mm -hmm. si sa uh, si Mayor Binay nawawala <laughs> it's because of this uh, <laughs> problem natin yung broadband so malaki mm -hmm. pong program. at the same time right now given the new normal ang malaking investment po natin tinitingnan is the ICT funding requirements for 
education in, uh, include the e-learning system, the e-classroom facility, and development mm -hmm. learning management. So I think with this 21 billion sa tingin ko, uh, actually, baka kulang pa nga sabihin nila is because if you really want to uh, provide all the needs of our implementing ages in terms of ICT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you, uh, Asikroli. Uh, since mentioned ka na, uh, there's this um, question also related to your presentation, and this one is from Emi Gyanan. How is Project Dime different from Open Government Initiative, also launched uh, before by the government? Oh, all right. There's no much different because oh, uh, the Project Dime is one of the commitment of the DBM in the Open Government Partnership. Because mm -hmm. an open government partnership is a platform, okay, wherein citizens can participate and being an open and participatory governance, we are encouraging to citizens to actively participate in this. So, uh, one of the commitment in the OGP is the project time. So, okay. there's no difference, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification, um, Asek Toledo. Okay. Uh, let me uh, address this next question to Assistant Governor Sikat of the BSP, ma'am. Um, sabi and this one is from Isabella Abustan. Okay. Um, are there governance innovations such as e-commerce transactions and digital transformation initiatives that would be flexible for the marginalized sector, especially for persons with disabilities, um, or the visually impaired who may have difficulty performing such online transactions? Um, actually, we have already issued a number of BSP circulars, but not okay. addressing directly the concerns of the uh, uh, related PWDs. PWD. However, uh, uh, with regards to this issue, uh, this will be considered in our ongoing review of policies and regulations. Okay. Thank that you very are, much. I, I would also like to uh, uh, mention that there are a number of initiatives, uh, legislative bills now pending in uh, in, mm -hmm. in Congress uh, would uh, assist, you know, concerns of the PWD, and we are mm -hmm. uh, supporting those legislative bills. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, um, Assistant Governor Sikat. And this next question is very interesting. No, it's about the, the issue of. Um, uh, lack of coordination, lack of harmonization across uh, government uh, agencies. And if I may direct this question to Asik Ab Abad Santos, uh, given that he is from NEDA, uh, this one is from Roxanne Yap. Uh, she said, agencies, both private and public, have undergone steps to take advantage of digital technologies to weather the current health and economic crisis. However, it seems that everyone is working in silos. What is being done to address this fragmented way of doing things and creating a backbone that will allow public and private service information systems to be linked and harmonized? Asek? Well, yes, um, I think the big um, pro project is the DACT's um, ano, um, national um, government portal and the national mm -hmm. um, and, and, and their, their, um, their initiative to sort of have one, one, a, 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 a one platform um, across government um, mm -hmm. that, that are interoperable. Um, and I guess that's also um, in terms of the best practices that was discussed earlier. I mean, I mean we need to have these systems interoperable. So at the, at the meantime, what's happening is that um, different agencies um, would actually um, do the initiatives on their own because they have to cope up with, with, with the requirements. But again, um, to maximize um, this and to ensure um, ensure um, better coordination, then we need um, that national um, platform, which is actually um, in the um, work plan of the ICT. And in fact, um, um, for for um, the budget for 2021, in fact, this, this was given, sorry, this was given priority um, in the national budget. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that response, Asik, uh, Asik Kaloy, no? Um We have a follow-up follow question for you, and this one is from uh, one of our um, Facebook viewers, uh, Minerva Bailon. May I know to what extent have reforms identified in the PDP been implemented and the results or effects of, and the results or effects of these reforms? 
We are very weak in terms of monitoring and evaluation of programs and projects and feedbacking these results to improve the program or project. Can results be measured in more specific terms or indicators and not in general statements? Well, um, indeed, uh, if you read um, um, the PDP update, which is a, which you will be releasing um, hopefully within within the within the month, is that um, mm -hmm. by the end of the month is that basically um, for the first half of the plan period, which is 2017 to 2022, we have seen a lot of reforms that mm -hmm. were instituted. I mean, major legislative reforms that have been instituted. We, we've had um, a lot of things: um, universal healthcare program, rice tarification act. Um, mm -hmm. We have the ease of doing business, um, and, and uh, we, we've done a lot of these major reforms, policy reforms. Um, um, what you have to do is to follow through these reforms because we want mm -hmm. to make sure the one one and one wanna will will, will will feel the benefits of these reforms. And um, basically, um, we have two levels of monitoring. Um, we have the core indicators, and this is outcome indicators, and we have also the major output indicators. And again, we report that. Uh, so basically, the reporting um, is both at the outcome indicator um, based on the outcomes mm -hmm. that were um, identified and major outputs per, per chapter of the Philippine Development Plan. Thank you very much, Asek. Uh... Uh, Abad Santos. Okay. Um, this next question is from Lord Lourdes Portus, and uh, this is directed to Asa Kroll and Assistant Governor uh, Sikat. Um, can you share how government agencies can enable the digital financial transactions? That, uh, for example, authorization of financial transactions using e-signatures and processing of payments without the need for original documents traditionally required by COA. Um, May we have first the response of um, Assistant Governor Sikat and then uh, ASEC uh, Rolly, ma'am? I'm having a problem with my uh, unmuting my, uh, okay, myself. Um, okay, ma'am. On the question, um, we have um, a regulatory body uh, within mm -hmm sector that uh, sets up the rules uh, on the type of transactions accepted in the digital platform and uh, acceptance of uh, e-signature I think is still uh, uh, being discussed uh, the, the group is uh, very cautious in uh, adopting um, uh, certain rules and standards just to ensure that uh, uh, just to ensure that uh, uh, that that consumer protection uh, are well uh, maintained. Um, basically, uh, that that particular group uh, looks into all the aspects uh, just to ensure that uh, e-signature, uh, if accepted later on, uh, can provide protection to the owner of the accounts. Okay, so thank you. Initiative is still uh, being uh, be, being uh, studied. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, by the way, my apologies to uh, Magdalena Mendoza because that question came from her. Uh, the question on uh, how to enable uh, government agencies to how to enable digital financial transactions among government agencies without need for original documents traditionally required by COA. I repeat, that question is from uh, Ms. Magdalena Mendoza. Now we go to the response of um, ASEC Aroni Toledo, sir. Sorry, i Okay, so thank you for that question. <clears throat> anyway, I you know just like uh, as mentioned also by uh, uh, Assistant Governor Sikat, there are also a body who sets the rules. And one mm -hmm. who sets the rules is here, as far as financing, financial is concerned, is our COA. The set of the accounting and COA rules and regulations. And I think that is one thing that uh, we have to uh, discuss with COA, but not definitely because as of this right now, we're still covered by these rules and regulations issued by COA. So, mm -hmm. but I think that's one thing that we can take a look right now, given this uh, uh, moving to the new normal, 
As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, actually we have already started in government, but not on the financial side, but in terms of uh, as to the administrative uh, as, as, as administrative procedures, like in terms mm -hmm. of uh, providing policy framework, uh, presently and uh, also uh, for issuance of policy procedures and inventory of deep internal documents. Issuance of policies and produce a use of digital signatures on external DBM documents. So, as far as we're concerned, we are already uh, looking at that uh, already. Not just, I think, not just only from the DBM, but as a whole, a whole of government in terms of the administrative procedure for a signature. But I guess uh, that is a discussion that will be uh, tackled with uh, our COA counterpart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asek Toledo. This next question is also for you, sir, if we may get your comment, your response on this. And this one is from Ayn In King of the Philippine Software Industry Association. Uh, he said, uh, there seems to be a lack of innovation in the government procurement process, which could easily make the processing time faster and better. Is there a current plan in place to better improve and motiv modify the current government procurement process. Also, uh, he added, I would like to emphasize that PSIA, uh, that's the Philippine Software Industry Association, has been has been strongly pushing for the priorities, prioritization of local IT and software com companies who are more than qualified to undertake the government projects in the digitalization efforts of the government. Maybe the NGA in charge or the national government ag agency in charge for streaming and improving the government procurement process could consider this in their efforts to digitalize the government. Asik Rolly. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm multitasking tayo ngayon. So I'm sorry, <laughs> Gina, the question so far. I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Okay. Yes, yes sir. Um, he is, uh, this, it's from Ayn In King of the Philippine Software Industry Association. Okay. Um, sabi niya kasi, there seems to be a lack of innovation in the government procurement process, which could make the processing time faster and better. So mm -hmm. he's asking if there is a current plan in place to better improve and modify the current government procurement process. All right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have been uh, already digitized, uh, improving uh, uh, information uh, or, or information technology, because right now, if you can see our uh, procurement system, uh, like for example, in the field jobs, uh, there's already an ongoing development at the same time and encouraging uh, business to really uh, register in the field job system. That is one of our uh, systems that right now are available for all our uh, right there in industries to participate in the procurement process. So we have already that one. Uh, probably mm -hmm. they have just be aware and look at our website, uh, the PS Field Jeff system. Okay. Thank you very much, Asset Toledo. No? So this next question is for everyone. Uh, perhaps we may ask uh, the, the um, comment of uh, Asik Abad Santos, also uh, Mayor Binay. Uh, and it is regarding the alternative work arrangements for public servants. Uh, there as um, uh, Isa is asking if there have been significant challenges or negative impact in terms of service delivery for the national or local government agencies for those that are not in the health sector, education sector, or social protection protection sector. What have been your observations so far in terms of uh, the effectiveness of the work from home scheme? Maybe start from uh, Mayor Abby, ma'am. What have been your observations, ma'am, with regard to the effectiveness of the work from home? Did it is it working, ma'am, uh, in your local government <laughs> among your civil servants? Well, to be honest, it it works for others, but it cannot work for everybody. The work from home mm -hmm. arrangement, for example. Uh, if you're a street sweeper, hindi ka naman pwede work from home. There are certain mm -hmm. job descriptions that yes. cannot, that is not, it is impossible to have a work from home arrangement. If you're a, mm -hmm. if you, if you work in the engineering department and you're a welder or you're a carpenter, obviously, hindi mo pwede mm -hmm. work from home arrangements dyan. So, um, because uh, our, our youth and sports division, of 
course, wala mm-hmm. naman kaming program na work from home. So, ang nangyayari ay uh, all the departments that have needs, we have to adjust. So, we we um, relocate them to a different department that mm-hmm. requires that certain need. So, um, actually, this is also an opportunity for us to be able to encode and digitize a lot of our documents, uh, which is which can be done from home. Uh, but again, the, the challenge there is that it's hard for internet sa amin. So, uh, we have to institute a program that is open. Yung Excel file na lang. You don't even need to use an, and you don't even need an internet connection. But uh, mm-hmm. we are adjusting. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think this is not a, uh, this is not a permanent, uh, it's not doable that it is, uh, it, uh, the work from home arrangements on a permanent basis. Hindi ho pwede sa civil service, um, sa be, being isang civil servant, hindi ho pwede yung work from home. Uh, may, may hangganan po yung work from home arrangements. Okay. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Mayor Abby. Uh, how about you, um, Asek um, Kaloy? Uh, would you have any uh, anything to say about this? Kasi NEDA has been conducting the surveys, ano? With the business sector, etc. Meron ba kayong collaboration with the CSC to, let's say, um, evaluate the effective effectiveness of the work from home scheme? Well, um, for, first thing, um, again, like like what Mayor um, Bina mentioned, is that the work from home arrangement um, is can be specific for certain functions. Yes, um, that's right. Not, but, but, but 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 again. Um, even this um, is not is constrained it's constrained um by a lot of things um Mm-mm. again your connectivity is a big constraint uh and, and, and second is the 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 readiness i mean i've seen um some some government agencies although their work um their work um can be adapted to work from home but mm-hmm. the staff na manila ay walang walang ano walang walang laptops Right. So, but even though yes, right. they can do that, um, but uh, in NEDA we were able to um, adapt um, um, easily because basically our work we don't have frontline services. And second, um, again, in terms of our staffs, we have we have laptops. But again, for other government agencies, um, asabi nila nga na kahit na ano kahit na the the type of work um pwedeng i, I- adapt um mm-hmm. hindi ni kaya. Um, mm-hmm. Second is that um, um, when we did the We Recover One report, we saw that um, um, there was limited work from home. If I recall, I'm not so sure, about 27% lang uh, nagsabi. Uh, but that's the early part um, of the of the of the lockdown. Um, I'm sure we've seen surge in in, in laptop sales. Uh, so I'm sure um, there's there's adapt um, adapting now. But again. I think um, um, I think as a catalyst or as an impetus, um, this um, pandemic has again um, accelerated um, looking at um, ano, an alternative work um, mechanisms. Before we were just talking about it, um, what, what are the different um, work arrangements that can be done in civil service? But after this, when the pandemic came, para na force to good. Uh, but again. It, it's now an impetus or a catalyst uh, again for civil service to again um, look at um, review their policies um, again to ensure that those um, functions that can be done uh, um, remotely um, they can provide the policy and um, regulatory framework uh, for 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 this um, this um, systems and mechanisms thank you very much Asikalo. we actually have a um a comment a note from um uh, miss magdalena mendoza senior vice president of of uh, the develop uh dap uh, development academy of the philippines she said the dap recently conducted an online survey on the effects of the alternative work arrangements on performance and productivity during the ecq we can share results with interested agencies. Salamat po, ma'am. We, we look forward to, to, to that report. Okay. Um, 
Okay, we still have uh, some questions from our participants. We hope um, you can uh, stay with us for a few more minutes to entertain those questions. This one is from Ebenezer, um, Professor Ebenezer Florano of uh, the UP. Uh, with regard to ICT, what are your issues, problems, and expectations from the DICT that would enable your agencies to leverage ICT in public service delivery? Perhaps we can um, get some few remarks, few responses. Let's say, baka um, pwede kay Mayor Binay muna, and then from other, from other, from our NGAs, ma'am. Expectations. From, uh, marami, expecta marami yung expectations sa DICT, pero I have, okay. my, one mantra I have is less expectations, less disappointment. Okay. So, uh, mahirap, well, I mean, it's very hard to depend uh, on the national government. So, hindi ko pwede that uh, aasa ka sa kanila. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping, hindi ko ako humihingi ng broadband connection, although dapat gawin po yan ng DICT. Hindi rin ako humihingi ng laptop, a tablet, pero pwede din ko sila tatanggapin po namin. Pero, um, I think the ICT should be more aggressive when it comes to uh, new technologies. Ano po ba ang available? Kasi hindi po lahat ng tao aware dun sa mga bago na um, um, possible na gamitin. For example, tele telemedicine. Telemedicine has been available for the past three, four years. And yet, uh, hindi po nila they don't pitch it, meaning, oh, this is available in the market, you might be interested. Um, mm -mm. Yung aware, kahit information dissemination lang. Uh, uh, most information I get uh, are from the private companies. Uh, for example, I had a meeting with this private company that we are seriously considering using artificial intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. dapat, dapat ho natin Para maging, para we keep up with the technology, the ICT should mm -hmm. tell us these are what are available in the market today. These are the, mm -hmm. the potentials of, what is the potentials of 5G? They don't even discuss that. And the ICT should be in the forefront for information that is available. What are the available technologies available? Hindi na lang yung broadband, kahit information lang. Okay. Salamat po, um, Mayor Binay. Um, can we go to the other questions? Kasi medyo madami pa po. And may I uh, um, address this question? This is for you, Asek to, uh, Roli Toledo. And this is from Jen Guste, Council for People's Development and Governance. Um, this is about your presentation. How is assessment of big ticket government projects undertaken, sir? How can CSOs participate in the process? And how can the um, assessment influence decision? How can the assessment influence decision if the project should proceed or not? Is the assessment exposed or ex ante or, or both? And then she added, we recommend that projects Project evaluation and approval be open to public participation. A number of uh, so-called big ticket development projects are implemented without transparency and accountability leading, leading to conflicts. Communities are physically and economically dislocated without proper relocation. Worse are red tag and individuals even killed. Uh, this is from Chen Guste of the Council for People's Development and Governance, a civil society organization. Sir? All right, thank you for that question. All right, uh, yes, uh, aside from our regular reporting uh, that we're doing in terms of the project monitoring and evaluation, and that is being <clears throat> uh, through the reports coming from, of course, the implement agency themselves, we at the Department of Budget and Management normally has this, what we call the uh, 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 assessment that's being done semi-annually in terms of the PA, uh, in terms of the utilization of funds, and in particular, of course, the implementation of programs and projects. And aside from that, you also submit to uh, implement the AGC, submit that to COA, where in the COA basically look at as to the implementation of programs, this would be, of course, the physical accomplishment. In addition to that, also, they're also requested to uh, 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 submit that uh, uh, status of programs and utilization to Congress. Aside from that, we are encouraging also the agencies 
to as a uh, part of the open uh participate uh, being an open you know uh, we're continuing with the transparency see wherein uh, agencies are required to post in their website the accomplishment of each programs and projects. Great. Okay. Now, mm. now, in terms of citizens' participation, uh, as a matter of fact, that is one thing that we have here right now in terms as, as far as the uh, participatory governance cluster at the same time, the open government partnership. We're in, of course, uh, uh, agencies are encouraged to uh, have their commitment and be. Uh, as part of the commitment of the Philippine Open Government Partnership, wherein they have to set a time lapse of implementation of programs, and that is being monitored and assessed uh, during the time time period, uh, at least a two year period, as, as far as the Open Government Partnership is concerned. And in addition to that, uh, we have also a, a lot of uh, platforms that is being right now used, as I mentioned in my presentation, the dev light mm -hmm. as far as the national government agency is concerned. And of course, even for uh, a project time, sorry, and even the yeah. deadline that is being now uh, implemented by the DILG. So there's a lot of platforms that uh, programs, projects, and uh, activities are being monitored, evaluated, and being, of course, shared for you, for the citizens to participate. And on top of that, uh, COA. Uh, has initiated this as is actually we have been globally recognized for this young citizens participatory audit. So we're in mm -hmm. OWA actually but, uh, together with the CSOs will uh, render our uh, audit to uh, pro projects that is being ano, kumbaga, identified what to be evaluated. So kasama mm -hmm. po dyan ang mga CSOs natin where in citizens actually right. participate to that. Yeah. Thank you. That's very good to know, uh, Asa Crowley. Asa Crowley, kanina you you, uh, you commented on a uh, uh, question regarding the procurement law, and this one is also related to the procurement law from Lani David, and he is she is asking if uh, uh, meron bang meron bang uh, inaplano ang DBM na review and possible revision of the procurement law that will enable uh, government uh, public sector agencies to. Uh, you know, the, so we can we can address um, issues in the procurement law, sir. Okay, I think uh, it will be very hard for us to open uh, the amendments of the procurement laws, but we can address that through the issuance of the resolutions by the GPPB. So there are mm -hmm. a lot already uh, issuances being uh, issuances by the GPPB in terms of how we can improve in our procurement process. Like in this case, uh, as far as uh, in, for the COVID pandemic, they've issued uh, a rather GPPB resolution in case of emergency purchases. So we have already that uh, provisions that GPPB is, is uh, issuing uh, when there's a need for us to really uh, look at how the procurement process can be improved. I mean to say, some of which will be uh, uh, more flexible for the agencies in terms of procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from that, there are also other modernization programs that's being now implemented, not just by the chief, uh, by the uh, by the by the government. Like for example, we are also improving and uh, the virtual store, the e marketplace. Uh, also, so we're looking at that. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, there is already uh, ongoing uh, virtual store that's now being used, the buy of common use supplies and equipment online. That mm -hmm. is now being participated by 589 agencies using the virtual store rolled out of mm -hmm. the out regions also. So there are already a lot of innovations at the same time, uh, she one says, uh, in order for us to improve our procurement. Thank you very much, Asak Toled. If I may uh, refer this question to um, Assistant Governor Sikat of uh, the BSP, because this concerns um, the use of cryptocurrencies or bitcoins. Um, Raymond De Vera, one of our Facebook viewers, is asking for any feedback um, on, ex on um, experience with cryptocurrencies. Probably he's, she's concerned or he is concerned about the security of using cryptocurrencies or bitcoins, ma'am. 
uh, is are are these under the ambit of uh, a BSP in terms of su supervision? Um, the, uh, the BSP adopts a sandbox uh, approach, as I've said earlier, where we don't readily stifle an initiative. However, mm -hmm. it does not endorse privately issued cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange or um, investment vehicles being highly speculative and uh, volatile in nature. At this mm -hmm. moment, our primordial uh, concern is to address any risk that may pose to the public consistent with our goal of increasing consumer protection. So uh, in that line, uh, we advise the public that uh, privately issued cryptocurrency is not a central bank issued currency. Okay. And we, uh, they are not regulated. So uh, whoever would like to uh, invest or buy uh, privately issued uh, cryptocurrency would know the risk that accompany such uh, investment. We so uh, I strongly caution the public against uh, uns uh, unscrupulous individuals or groups who offer vir uh, virtual currency pyramid schemes disguised as initial coin offerings or uh, investment products. However, for monitoring the BSPE uh, circular number 944 sometime in February 2017, which requires uh, engage in exchange issued cryptocurrency for equivalent fiat money to register with the BSP as remittance and transfer companies. Thank you very much, Assistant Governor Sikat. Um, okay, we're down to our last two questions uh, because it's already 11.43, no? So um, this one is from um, our official from uh, the from the DEP Development Academy of the Philippines, uh, Magdalena Mendoza. And uh, she she commented on uh, the um, the different levels of digitization uh, among government agencies, both at the national and local levels. And she's asking, how can we accelerate the diffusion and upscaling of these innovations? Uh, perhaps we can throw this question to uh, Ned Assistant um, Secretary Carlos Abad Santos. Asik? Hello? Yes. Um, okay. Um, I, I think um, it's um, it's both um, having, um, again, it's important to, to, to have the, the, the basic requirements in place mm -hmm. in terms of um, infrastructure systems and processes, but at the same time, again, um, ensuring um, ensuring um, knowledge management within the bureaucracy. And I guess that's, I think, where the AP, among others, can also help um, government in terms of um, ensuring a knowledge management culture. Um, but civil service, the AP, um, could uh, ensure a knowledge management culture within within um, the bureaucracy and within government. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Glenn Munez of uh, the Norfield Foundation. Given the current restrictions brought by COVID-19, what are the current innovations in place or might be in, in the pipeline to ensure inclusive and participatory planning process both at the local and national government agencies. Uh, perhaps we can ask uh, Mayor B. Naiman, um, how do we ensure that uh, the planning process is still participatory in this time of the pandemic? Well, the, the only difference is the mode, which is through teleconferencing. So yes. the drafting of our AIP, the draft, our budget process, the convening of the MCDC, uh, the conduct of the uh, council, uh, here council sessions is either Facebook Live or uh, again, uh, through teleconferencing. So. Uh, like ito, yung ginawa natin today, it is open to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, it's just the mode, but it is yes. still uh, participatory. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, Asik Kaloy, would you like to comment on that? Um, how, how 
can we make sure or are there initiatives, let's say, at the NGA level to ensure that the planning process is still participatory in this, uh, you know, um, in in this time of the pandemic we're in, you know, we're working from home, uh, we are following alternative work arrangements. Well, um, I think um, uh, I, I agree with with with, uh, with um, mm -hmm. Mayor. Right? Is that actually um, it's it's just the mode and the mechanism um, mm -hmm. that that, that um, might be different. But again, if 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 um, it, but if you have a framework um, for for um, public consultation and 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 um, engagement uh, with your stakeholders. I mean, it's just the the mode that that would change. In mm -hmm. fact, I think one 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 air one advantage. There are disadvantages to 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 this remote um, mechanism, but there are also advantages. Um, and one of them is that basically, um, you 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 can uh, potentially harness um, more uh, more participants. Sean, um, because um, restrictions in terms of venue and everything yes. um, mm -hmm. um, are, are eased a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Asa Kaloy. Uh huh. So I think we have covered um, the all the questions. I hope from 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 all our uh, participants. Uh, okay. Okay, let me just um, review our chat box quickly it, to ensure that I did not miss any. Uh, okay, there's this one interesting question from Norris Valguera, and this is about uh, the academic industry and government partnership. And um, he, he said, industry and government need to realize that tapping the academic brings a lot of benefits. Bukod sa mura po. And academe needs to look deeper into the needs of industry and government. Perhaps we can um, uh, address this last question to uh, Mayor Bina because uh, she uh, said in in his in her presentation that uh, yung isa sa mga innovation nila, I think contact tracing ba yon, ma'am? And in which ang ginamit yung uh, software or this technology was from the pamantas sa ng Makati map? Well, uh, the COVID-19 platform that we used for purposes of uh, patient management and contact tracing was developed by the University of Makati. So, uh, yung academe, yung mga estudyante ang gumawa ng platform. So, we did not uh, need a third-party provider or spend money. Uh, for for someone to develop that platform. So uh, that's a perfect example of where an academe can, the uh, a university can help in uh, governance. So naging, naging malaking tulong po yung aming uh, university. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Bina. And as much as we'd like to extend this forum, I think it is now time to close our uh, q and a and at this point may i uh, request our panelists for their final remarks for our audience uh can we start with uh mayor abby then to be followed by um assistant governor sikat then uh asek toledo and then asek kaloy and then we would also like to hear from a representative from our uh, a uh, group of uh, research fellows from PIDS, ma'am. So again, I'd like to say thank you to PIDS for the invitation. Uh, I hope you learned something from the city of Makati because because I most definitely learned a lot from the other departments today. Uh, DBM initiatives, the procurement initiative, civil service. So it looks like we're all on the same track. So uh, stay safe, everybody, and I hope we overcome this pandemic very very soon thank you very much ma'am abby okay uh governor assistant governor sika please your final remarks ma'am yeah yeah i'd like to reiterate the point i uh, made earlier uh first the pandemic highlighted the need for and preference towards safe and efficient electronic payments and settlement system in the country and we'd like to emphasize that the bsp has been in the forefront of this innovation and second, the BSP remains committed uh, in implementing the necessary policy measures and reforms, including the 
facilitation of digital transformation to help the Philippines recover from the COVID-19 crisis and to build, further build our resilience against future crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Asset Crawley, sir. Uh, yes. Final um, remarks for Yes, uh, thank you very much again for PIDS for inviting us here in this uh, webinar. And I would just like to say that even before the COVID-19 pandemic has struck the country, our government has already been at the forefront uh, in mainstreaming technology-driven initiatives in order to meet the demands of the uh, revolution. So with the onslaught of the pandemic, the relevance of ICT mediated reform has been more, even more apparent. Now, as we strive towards making uh, a better normal, we'll continue to support and promote initiatives that strengthen information and communication technology or ICT infrastructure for a more efficient delivery of all agencies and institutions. So we guarantee that budgetary support is set aside for the next year to support ICT development and infrastructure. And we hope that through this, we'll be able to help the Filipino people adapt with and in, in transition to the post-pandemic life. So thank you again and thank you, Asek Rolly and um, Asek uh, Kaloy. Yes, um, I think moving forward and adapting to the new normal, um, we would need a lot of um, new policies um, with regards to um, institutional um, innovation, particularly also in governance and. I think um, um, this initiative of um, PIDs for, for, for this DPRM on this will, will actually um, help shape um, policy. Um, and we look forward to the, dif to the different uh, no, um, the, your, your, your different um, activities that you have for this, for this month. In fact, I'm, I'm so interested in, on, on your Mindanao leg because okay. um, it's agriculture so we, we, yes, we want sir. to actually look at that because we feel that the sector also needs a lot of um innovations and, yes um, sir. To, um, um, to increase um its um its share of gdp thank you very much thank you very much Atseka, Bad Santos. and uh, from our uh, pids research fellows uh Aubrey, would you like to go first and then uh, charlotte Thank you, um, Dr. Shar. So from, from all these uh, initiatives and innovations uh, that were shared to us by, by NEDA, DBM, and ICPLTU, and the promising uh, trends in electronic transactions that Assistant Governor Tika Tafik, as we presented a while ago, they all indicate and noted in our paper that there are a lot of opportunities um, despite the challenges that we face, that innovations are, are everywhere, even for, for a developing country like ours. So. It is now important uh, to concentrate efforts on the issues that uh, we need to overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Uh, Charlotte, uh, uh, Justine, I mean, would you like to say to add anything? Yes, thank you, Dr. Shea. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. It's it's nice to hear from all of the panelists and how mm -hmm. we are all aligned to bounce back together, uh, innovating governance. And this is the opportune time, in fact, to propel and continue to propel reform and formal institutions and the manner by which these are implemented through governance to improve public delivery of goods and services. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, please join me in thanking our uh, speakers and panelists for the knowledge and insights that they have shared in, in our forum this morning. Let's give them um, a big virtual clap. And thanks to all of you for your questions and comments. We hope our conversation this morning has helped everyone better understand and appreciate um, our DPRM theme for this year of uh, um, bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. This form, however, is just a prelude to the, the more in-depth discussion on governance innovation, and we will further unpack the DPRM theme to the series of webinars that we have um, organized for you for the entire month of, of September. I now call on the Vice President of PIDS, Dr. Marife Ballesteros, for her closing remarks. Thank. Hi, thank you, Sheila. Good, good morning, everyone. I think our panel panelists have given the, the key points for discussion, but I, I would just like to add 
Uh, in conclusion, a few thoughts on what uh, we on what we have discussed today. I think what we're, what we're seeing is that every crisis leads us to rethink our governance governance strategies. And uh, while indeed government has been uh, doing innovations in the past, even before the the pandemic, I think one of the realization we have now is that the ability to innovate is key to. Uh, resilience building and to good governance. So we have seen that uh, innovation in terms of technology advancement is not only for the private sector, but also for, for, for the government. In fact, the government should take the lead in all of these uh, governance innovations. And what we have seen from our presentations today is that uh, government is heeding this call and gearing up to improve public service through various reforms in institutions, in systems, processes, products, and organizations. Government is embracing the digital economy and harnessing the advantages of the fourth industrial Re revolution in different aspects of public service, in planning, budgeting, and uh, treasury management, financial services, club, uh, project implementation, and local governance. Um, I would just like to add that uh, I, I think the BSP has been in the forefront of financial technology and through the BSP's uh, proactive uh, role, the digital transformation of our financial services in the country has significantly advanced. And our cities are also moving towards technology enabled and paperless systems as uh, uh, the example provided by the city of Makati. I know that the city of Makati in particular has been proactive in digital innovation. In fact, in 2019, um, it was uh, considered as one of the finalists for World Smart Cities Awards. And congratulations uh, to uh, Mayor Binay for that. So uh, despite all of these innovations we have in government, we also know that there are a lot of cha uh, remaining challenges that the government should continue to confront. And one of these is the need to upgrade our uh, digital infrastructure, the need to overcome the limitations of existing laws for the digital economy, the readiness uh, of uh, government work of the government workforce as well as in, uh, the general public to, to the digital economy. And we still have to look at uh, improve on uh, the coordination in government. Uh, there's a lot of efforts to be done in terms of uh, interoperability and in terms of the uh, monitoring system and capacity building in, uh, in government workforce. So finally, uh, on behalf of uh, PIDS, uh, our heartfelt thanks to our speakers for taking the time to join PIDS to start off the celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. And thank you as well for staying with us until the end of this conference. So our thanks to all our uh, to the all who registered and participated in this uh, event. Uh, thank you for your active participation. And I think we also have the press, members of the press in the in the audience. And uh, thank you for your support to PIDS in disseminating DPRM events as well uh, uh, to a wider audience. So uh, may I uh, just uh, repeat again or uh, re reiterate what uh, uh, Director Shiel has mentioned that we are inviting you to the upcoming APPC webinars, which will provide a global discussion on all on uh, uh, governance innovations. So thank you once again. I wish you all a, a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Balistares, for your insightful remarks to uh, cap our uh, kickoff forum this morning. Uh, but before we finally close, uh, just a few reminders. Um, okay, flash on the screen is the link where you can access all the presentations. Uh, okay, and then, but we will also email you the link after the webinar. And then um, please also answer the feedback survey that will pop in on your screen after this webinar. And we will also email you the link after the event. Um, please uh, do take time to answer the feedback survey. Your comments are very important to us to 
improve our webinars. Also, regularly visit our website and social media pages. Um, thanks to all our uh, to all our Facebook viewers, and also uh, please um, regularly visit our website for um, copies of all our knowledge products and also um, information about our forthcoming events. For more information about the uh, Development Policy Re Research Month and the activities for uh, the whole month of September, just visit our the DPRM website at dprm.pids.gov.ph. And then um, for well, Director um, Dr. Balisteros and Dr. Um, uh, Cellulares have already mentioned the APPC, but just uh, additional information. Okay, flash on the screen is is the poster of our uh, APPC. Don't forget, uh, save the dates: September 15, September 17, September 22, and September 24. And we also have, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Asika Bad Santos, of course, we have the Mindanao Policy Research Forum, which is. Uh, uh, on September, I think, September 18. Sep no, no, September 18, yes. Um, still tentative, um, in just in terms of the date, but we will tell you of uh, the uh, final date. Uh, just um, uh, visit our website and our social media pages. Okay, and then finally, we'd like to acknowledge the various government uh, various organizations from the government, academia, civil society, business, and international development community, and our and uh, our friends from the media who join us today, and you can see the names of these offices on the screen. Again, thank you so much for joining us in this kickoff forum to herald the start of the Development Policy Research Month. We hope to see you in our next events this September to celebrate the DPRM. Enjoy the rest of your day and always stay safe. Stay healthy and stay informed. Maraming salamat po.